FDA for almost 10 years. I think I'm right, Ralph. And in addition to that, served for nine years on the board of directors. Um, he has done and transformed THDA in so many ways. I know he's been out there all across the state of Tennessee, as has Commissioner Carter. So many of you all have had the opportunity to know and work with him. Ralph, too, has been integral at not only state and local levels, but also at the national level as a member of the Advisory Council and the Federal Home Loan Bank of Cincinnati. So with that said, I will turn the mic over and thank each and every one of you, 250 of you all who are doing this noble work every single day to try to keep and prevent evictions from occurring. Thank you and have a great day. Commissioner Carter, would you like to go first? I I'm going, would be pleased to. Um, <clears throat> uh, thanks for the opportunity to, um, to join in to this important uh, collaboration. Um, and um, Director Tate, I wanna, I wanna thank you for your leadership in convening um, all of the different component parts of the, this very complex problem that we are trying to address. And so what I wanna talk about for just a couple of minutes is um, that the, the necessity for the collaboration that will ultimately allow us to work our way through this very complex problem. You know, we are we are joined here by both public and private resources that if knitted together properly can help us um, achieve our lofty, our lofty goals here. And I wanna begin by saying that um, it is important from my perspective in this extremely polarized political environment that we find ourselves in today. Um, that, you know, that we, we take sides on every single issue and the other side is always bad or wrong. What I will, what I will ask of us in this issue of the work to ensure that everybody is able to have a roof over their head is that there are not villains and victims in this eviction discussion. You, you have on one side of this a need for individuals to have, a, to have shelter, to have a roof over their head. And the way that, that they have engaged in that is by entering into contract with a homeowner or, 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 or landlord that makes um, that, that space available. Well, as we have gone through the challenge of this pandemic, because our initial posture was folks stay at home, many folks were unable to work. And so therefore, because they weren't able to work, were unable to earn. And through their earnings, by which they would pay the property owner, um, they were unable to do that. And so government put a moratorium on, uh, on evictions for failure to pay rent. Okay. On the other side, you have the property owner. The, the individual or, 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 or family who has worked to, to, to make a piece of property available in which there is a mutual transaction for them to make that, that property available to 
to, um, to, to individuals or families who need a roof over their head um, and for the exchange uh, of, of a dollar to, 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 to pay for that property. Okay. And, uh, um, and, and, and so both sides in this discussion have a, have a mutual uh, um, right and responsibility. So I think first it is important for us to not demonize any of the players in this. We have a challenge to solve. And, and so we need to work together to solve that, understanding that there are mutual accommodating interests involved. Not good guys and bad guys, but mutual accommodating interest, which we need to resolve. And I would ask that that be the way that we approach solving this challenge in Tennessee. Okay. Uh, um, the second I would say, and this is um, leveraging off of Director Tate's introductory remarks, is that I think that we actually have both a prevention and an intervention role in this. We can do much better up front. We, we can do much better up front to prevent people, if you will, from coming into the stream. But we also have to realize that there are many that are already in the stream and we have to intervene to help get them through the stream and out. So that we have to take both a prevention and an intervention approach. And we are, are, are looking to, to weave those together to be able to take a, a comprehensive approach. And so next I move to, um, I, I move to collabor collaboration and leveraging. One of the challenges of design of, of government, the design of government is that it is designed vertically. There are many different verticals that each tackle one component of the health, safety, and welfare uh, of, of, a, of a state or a community. And, and so we have here represented a number of those verticals. But the truth is, we will not be able to solve this problem if we simply invoke our verticals. We have to have a horizontal connecting strategy. And so that is why um, uh, Director Tate, Commissioner Perry, myself, Commissioner Williams, and others come together in a forum like this to actually have a horizontal integration of all of our verticals around solving this complex problem. Because each of us bring a, um, bring a piece of the puzzle towards solving the, 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 the very um, challenging problem that, that, that we are confronting here. And, and so uh, collaboration is essential. And what I would um, say as I begin to bring this to, to, the, to a close, in collaboration, DHS has resources and assets that we are prepared to bring to this challenge. And, and in, in, the, in, the way of, in the way of funding, in the way of assets at the community level that we have access to. And so we are willing partners. We are willing to be at the table and, and design interventions. And we are willing to make the, the assets and resources that DHS has available 
to be part of this problem solving. So we are very willing partners. We, we, don't, take, uh, we don't take the lead in this. We believe that we are at the table amongst equals. And we are prepared to put our resources on that table to, to join with all of the other resources to be able to take a whole of Tennessee approach to this very delicate issue of ensuring that, uh, um, that every Tennessean is able to have a roof over their head and that those that, um, that are in the, in the part of the problem solving where they are making those rules available, that, um, that all of the interests are honored as we approach this issue together. And so um, I, 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 those are the things that I wanted to share with you this morning. And um, I, will, I will turn it back uh, to uh, Director Tate to hear from my, my, my colleague, Ralph Perry, on what uh, the HDC can bring, will bring to this. Ralph, it's good to be with you this morning. And um, the floor is yours, sir. Well, thank you, Commissioner. And thank you, Director Tate. Good to be with everyone this morning. I uh, have to begin with a word of thanks to our, our friends and partners at the Administrative Office of the Courts, the Department of Human Services, judges, advocates, all of you who are working with us to keep Tennessee and safely housed. THDA is proud to be part of that effort uh, through our administration of the Rent Relief Program. Uh, Cynthia Peraza, THDA's Director of Community Programs, and Assistant Director Bill Lord will be on later in this program to talk about that in some greater detail. But I think all of us know that preventing evictions is really a broader issue. The rent relief program that Congress enacted was specifically targeted to those who lost jobs or income during COVID and were unable to keep up with their rent payments. It is not, however, a blanket eviction prevention program, and not everyone who is facing eviction is going to be eligible under the terms of the federal program. But just the same, we want everyone in that circumstance to know about this program so that we can help all those we possibly can, and perhaps buy some time for those we can't help with our program so that they have the opportunity to get support and assistance through legal aid or our colleagues at Department of Human Services. There's some noteworthy work being done on that already. I'm particularly glad to see Judge Rachel Bell as part of the program today. THDA last week signed an agreement with the Tennessee Alliance for Legal Services. We will provide over $5.6 million to them to support their work in helping those who are in imminent risk of eviction. But as the commissioner mentioned, there is another and largely overlooked group in this conversation that is going to need our help. And those are landlords. And unfortunately, and I think unfairly, there are many who are trying to make them the villains of the peace. In my experience, most landlords have tried to work with their tenants who are financially impacted by COVID, folks who were good tenants and regular payers until everything shut down and they lost their ability to pay. Many of the small landlords are struggling financially now. And for them, the eviction moratorium, however well intended it was, but for them, it represented a government edict that they have to house people for free and that's just unsustainable. Small landlords account for roughly half of the rental housing units in our state, and they represent the majority of what's referred to as naturally occurring affordable housing. If those landlords fail financially, or if they just throw in the towel and sell out to hedge funds, we're going to lose a lot of that affordable housing, and that merely compounds the problem that we're trying to solve. So shoring up those landlords has to be part of the solution. At THDA, we're stepping up our efforts to make landlords aware of the rent relief program, to encourage them to participate. Ideally, the federal government would help us to do that. But in the meantime, we're going to do what we can in this state, because keeping landlords solvent is one important aspect of keeping tenants housed. There are broader societal issues involved in the whole eviction issue. And they go beyond a tenant's ability to pay the rent. 
those factors are beyond this agency's authority or ability to influence. But it is where many of you are in a position to help. And I thank you for being willing to step up and do so. The Tennessee Housing Development Agency looks forward to our continued efforts together to help keep our fellow Tennesseans decently housed. And we're pleased to be part of this important discussion today. With that, uh, Debbie and Louise, I'll toss it back to you. Thank you all so much for helping frame the issue and for giving us your time um, today. I'm going to quickly move us along to our next presenters. Um, we have some um, others from THDA joining us. We have uh, Cynthia Peraza. She's the Director of Community Programs. And then after we hear from Ms. Peraza, uh, we'll hear from Bill Lord. He's the Assistant Director of Community Programs at THDA. So um, I'm going to be running um, some of the slides throughout the day. So just, uh, you know, I, I apologize but you'll hear some of those next slide next slide um, but um, Cynthia let me get that pulled up and then um, we'll get going. Thank you Emily I appreciate your assistance with that. I'll go ahead and start by saying good morning to everyone and before I start um, I do want to mention that I will not be pausing for questions or to answer any comments that are submitted through the chat box at this time. I'm gonna wait till the end of the presentation. So I just wanted to go ahead and share that, but please feel free to start dropping any comments or question there. And we have someone else uh, responding to those as they come through as fast as they can. So my name is Cynthia Peraza and I am the director of the community programs division within the Tennessee Housing Development Agency, or as we call ourselves, THDA. THDA is administering the COVID rent relief program for the state of Tennessee in all counties, except for four that administer their own emergency rental assistance program. Those counties include Shelby, Davidson, Rutherford and Knox, and I'm sure you'll hear from them throughout the day. Next slide, please. The coronavirus pandemic, or as we call it, the COVID-19 has hit us all by surprise. Nobody could have imagined or prepared for the impact this virus has had on our nation. As a state, Tennessee experienced a significant amount of job losses due to business closures, business volume decreases, school closures, unexpected medical costs, and the costs associated with the passing of a loved ones or excessive medical Ill, um, costs as well. Next slide, please. The COVID pandemic and its resulting economic downturn have disproportionately affected renter households particularly those who rely on wages from at-risk jobs. These impacts are troubling because the pandemic hit at a time when nearly half of all the renters within Tennessee were already cost burdened, meaning they were paying more than 30% of their income for housing already. Next slide, please. In order to provide access to financial assistance to renter households, the U.S. Department of Treasury created the Emergency Rental Assistance Program, or as we call it, the ERA, now I'm not gonna to read to you the statute or our interpretation of it, but what I, what I will say is that um, this program is constantly, uh, the guidance from treasury and the programs are constantly changing. And in many instances, it is for the benefits of the tenants. So it's not a bad thing at all. I'm gonna walk you through some highlights of our iteration of the ERA, or as what we call it, the COVID-19 Rent Relief Program. And I'm sure you'll learn a little more about the other counties that administer their own ERA program throughout the day and how their programs slightly differ from ours. So what's THDA COVID Rent Relief Program about? Next slide, please. Our um, COVID Rent Relief Program is, as I said previously, it's an emergency rental assistance program that's funded by the U.S. Department of the Treasury. It helps renter households who were financially impacted by the COVID-19 um, access uh, funding for um, rental assistance and other costs to help them remain housed and prevent homelessness. THDA through its COVID rent relief program offers up to 15 months of assistance to eligible tenants to help cover those rental arrearages, future rent payments, and also utility arrearages. I did want to point out that THDA funds rental assistance directly to landlords, and we fund the utility assistance directly to utility companies. Next slide, please. And you saw that I had mentioned just a few costs there, but I did wanna point out the fact that there are other eligible costs 
uh, for our program. I listed a few of them here, and I did want to point out um, the relocation costs. So these are new eligible costs that are becoming available later this month. Um, THD is constantly reevaluating its program to determine how we could get these emergency resources to tenants and landlords in need of financial assistance as soon as possible. We work closely with our neighboring states to collaborate on best practices and how we could learn from each other to improve our programs as new treasury guidance is published. Uh, but more importantly, um, you know, this list is not all inclusive. It's constantly changing. But again, we're excited to offer this new uh, cost for relocation of a tenant. Uh, that also includes the first and last month's rents, application fees, credit report fees, um, and uh, the disconnection and reconnection fees are always um, necessary as well. Next slide, please. To date, we've assisted uh, 3,388 tenants. We've helped them remain housed, and we funded a little over $20 million, which is not a bad place to be considering we launched uh, as of March 1st this year with minimal guidance. So I feel that we're doing great and we're slowly seeing those numbers uh, double uh, in sizes. So we're excited to offer assistance to more Tennesseans across the state sooner than later. Next slide, please. To access our program, you have to meet five basic criteria of the program. It's uh, as, as they're pointed out here. So you have to be a resident of Tennessee, be obligated to pay rent under a lease for a property that's located within one of the counties that we fund. Um, you also have to um, be at a maximum annual household income that does not exceed 80% of the area median income for the county where the residence is located. Now, you may not know what that 80% area median income means, but THD does have a chart that illustrates the maximum household incomes by county that's available on our website, and you'll have uh, access to that website at the end of these slides. Um, now that you've checked that, oh, I'm sorry, let me go ahead and get to the next slide. There's two more criteria that are required. One or more individuals uh, within the household has to have either qualified for unemployment benefits or since May 13th, 2020, had experienced a reduction in income, incurred significant costs, or experienced other financial hardships due directly or indirectly to the COVID-19 outbreak. And the last uh, criteria is one or more individuals within the household uh, has to demonstrate that they are at risk of experiencing homelessness or housing instability which may be easily documented through uh, past due a utility notice or uh, a late rent notice or an eviction notice or other documentation to prove unsafe or unhealthy living conditions. So now that you've checked off all those boxes, uh, next slide. I'm sure you're wondering how you could initiate that application to access this money. So a landlord or a tenant could start the application process. When one applies, the other receives a notification. So it's an easy process to get everyone involved. Uh, but it is important to note that we do require both the landlord and tenant to participate in the process. And the landlord must agree to accept the COVID-19 rent relief payment from THDA. Um, next slide, please. Now you're probably asking, why should a landlord apply, right? Uh, I've got six bullets here to explain that to you. The application that uh, we've created through for the COVID rent relief program is easy and seamless. It's not a very, it's not time consuming. And we've also created the opportunity for landlords to create, um, to submit production in bulk. So they could upload multiple tenants information if they feel that they all need or uh, are in need of assistance. Uh, the program allows the landlord to recoup all expenses incurred by the tenant, including those eviction filing costs and court costs. Um, Thank you. The tenant does not have to be delinquent to receive assistance and the program. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Give me a second while we get back to where we were at. Technical glitches, they happen. <laughs> Thank you for that, Anne Louise. Uh, back to where we were. So why should a tenant apply for the COVID rent relief program? Again, the application's easy. The ability to upload uh, bulk uh, tenant information is available. The program allows the landlord to recoup all expenses incurred by the tenant, including those uh, filing costs or court costs incurred. Uh, it's important to note that the tenant does not have to be delinquent for them to receive assistance. So even if the um, their tenants aren't delinquent, they could still provide us their information and their bulk tenant information, and we could reach out to them to see if they've uh, been impacted negatively by COVID. Um, the program funds um, the landlord directly, so the rental assistance is guaranteed to them after the tenant is approved. They don't have to worry about that tenant uh, receiving the payment and maybe uh, not providing them with that funding in a timely manner. 
Uh, and it's also important to notate here that if the landlord refuses to participate in the program, the tenant can potentially uh, receive the funding directly from THDA. Uh, and uh, the tenant could use that money to either fund their previous landlord for those arrearages that they uh, had, or they could use it to fund future rent to, for another landlord. It's at their discretion. So that's another good reason to encourage landlords participation in the program. Next slide. Now here's a couple bullets to uh, explain why it's important for a tenant to apply for the COVID early program. Uh, I go back to the fact that that application is extremely easy to use. It's also mobile uh, phone friendly. Uh, we have a robust, a robust call center also that could provide them with support or if uh, they get stuck anywhere, they also could uh, navigate through some of those technical issues. We also provide uh, financial assistance to help keep the tenant housed and prevent homelessness. If that's not a reason enough to apply, I'm not sure what is. Um, the program also provides assistance for delinquent utility costs. So that's water, gas, um, all the utility costs. If they're delinquent, we could help bring them current. And once again, uh, the tenant does not have to be delinquent on their rent for, to receive assistance from this program. But if they are, we could uh, pay for delinquent rent that they may owe their previous landlord. And that's, um, that, that's a huge plus for them if they've left delinquent rent behind. Uh, for their previous residents, it may be hard for them to access new housing. So if we could help them clear off that uh, negative credit mark, that's definitely something the program could assist with. Um, the program also provides assistance to relocate the tenant if the landlord is unwilling to participate in the program or if the tenant is unable to afford the rent payment after uh, the assistance is added. So uh, again, the plenty of benefits for the landlord and tenants to participate. Uh, next slide, please. So I know I've provided you a lot of information that may have triggered <laughs> numerous questions. I encourage you to uh, drop those questions or comments in that chat box right now. Um, and I'll be happy to start answering some of those questions shortly. Now, in the event, I know we're running out of time, in the event uh, we don't have the ability to answer all those questions or reply to all the comments, um, I do wanna encourage you all to visit our websites. We have numerous uh, FAQs, frequently asked questions listed on the website. And also, if you prefer to email or call us, uh, next slide. We have all the information available for you here. Um, I didn't get too deep into the application process because I'm going to be passing that baton over to Mr. Lord to uh, walk you through that process. But really quick, let me pause for a second here to see if there are any questions that I may help answer at this point. Um, Bill, have you had a chance to read through some of these questions? Or um, I didn't know if we had time for that, uh, Anna Louise. Um, we could probably have the time for maybe one right now, but what we can do is um, we'll go through all the questions that have come up in the chat and we can either be answering them during future sessions um, in the summit and or um, we'll call those and then send those out to the presenters and get those answered and posted more as a Q&A. That's perfectly fine. And what I could do is I'll be here for a while so I could go in and respond to as many comments as I can. Uh, but uh, again, the information on, of our websites listed on here. Our call center number is listed on here, and if you'd like, if you prefer to email like, as I do, you're welcome to drop us an email at the COVID rent relief at thda.org. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for your time and for the opportunity to present our program to you today. Um, we look forward to hearing from you soon. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to do one last uh, slide for us, Anne Louise. I'm going to pass the baton over to Mr. Bill Lord, who will walk everyone through step-by-step uh, -step instructions of how to apply for this program. Thank you for your time. All right, good morning. Um, I am uh, assuming I'm, I'm on, so uh, I'm still seeing Cynthia's name in my box. Yes, you are, we can hear you now. Thank okay, you. as long as you can hear me, I'll go ahead and get started. So uh, I want to thank you again for joining us this morning. We really do appreciate it. Uh, Cynthia, I answered as many of the questions coming through as I could uh, as they were coming in, but there were several I did not uh, I did not get to or that got skipped the way the chat keep jumps up. Of course, I missed some, so uh, we'll need to answer those, and we'll be happy to answer them as well. So this morning, what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to take you through uh, and show you on a screen by screen basis how this application works. So there were some questions that pertain to the application that it's 30 pages and it's extremely difficult. I think when we go through this, you'll see it's really not that difficult. Uh, we are working on 
uh, solutions on a daily basis just about how to make it uh, uh, make this more user friendly, make this process uh, easier, find better ways for individuals to access the process uh, that may not have computer access. So we are working toward those things. So I know there were some questions around that. I just wanted to mention it first. Uh, I'm going to go through this uh, now. So I'm going to share uh, my screen with you and show you a presentation. It will take me just a second to get that up here. All right, I am uh, assuming and hope that you have our presentation where you can see it. So the COVID-19 rent, uh, rent relief program, of course, uh, we launched that on March 1st, started taking applications on March 1st. It's important to remember that these funds were only passed the statute on December the 27th. This, this is a very fast program to stand, uh, very fast to stand a $300 million plus program that no systems existed to administer. So. Uh, we had to do this from some scratch straight up. So I think that uh, uh, you'll agree we've done a reasonably good job, not to say it hasn't been without glitches or, or some difficulty, it certainly has. So I'm going to take you through the process of the tenant application uh, now. Uh, of course, for help, you can access assistance by calling the call center. Uh, they're open 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Saturday. Uh, you can come to thda.org. Uh, of course, 24 hours a day to apply. There's an access there to the application portal. Uh, and on that page, it will also give you some uh, frequently asked questions and things of that nature. These are the folks involved with that this uh, uh, grant. And so we're gonna make this slide presentation um, uh, available to you. So the COVID-19 rent relief access that I said on the thda.org site, uh, looks like this. This is our main page and you'll find the COVID-19 rent relief uh, or over in the side navigation, it's available as well. And you just click on that, learn more or click on that. And it's gonna take you to this page uh, right here. And this is actually the application portal. So I wanna bring to your attention, there are some questions down here. I don't have the entire page on here, but there are some frequently asked questions that, that will take you through many of the issues. It talks about portability, talks about whether or not you can, uh, uh, how you get arrears paid and then how you get prospective rent paid, how you get utilities paid, what's eligible, what's not eligible. As Cynthia already said, THDA serves what we call the balance of the state. There were four counties, including one city who received funds directly from the Treasury Department to administer this program, uh, Shelby, Knox, Rutherford, uh, and Davidson. Uh, and inside of Shelby County, Memphis, the city of Memphis. So uh, they are operating their program, even though there's two as a single program. Other than that, ten, uh, THDA will serve the other 91 counties. And if you are in those 91 counties, you can access it through this page. So after you click into access the portal, I wanna get started. This is where you're gonna come to. You're gonna come to a page that just tells you a little bit about it. Um, gives you where, whether you're a tenant or whether you're a landlord. You're gonna choose which one of those you are to access the application. And now I know this is tiny on the actual screen, it's much larger. This is just a screenshot. I just wanna kind of take you through. The first thing you'll see though, is a program overview. And it's gonna talk all about the program and the rules of the program and the kind of documents you might need to apply uh, and have ready when you start the application process and move forward. Uh, in here, it's going to have it, 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 it's going to have uh, issued you a case number, and that's going to be really important. You're going to need to write that down and keep that. You'll be able, and you're going to have a, a a username and password. You're going to be able to access your information at any time using those items. After you've gone through that overview, and it's just something for you to read, you're going to come to the initial eligibility screen. On this screen, we're collecting just a little information about you. And it is, it's, are you see, uh, seeking assistance for renter utilities for your primary residence? This is the main eligibility. Those are the requirements to, to be eligible. Uh, is, you, is your household income at or below 80% of the area median income? And it will actually tell you what that is based on the county that you live in. Uh, that's going to be important for you to know that because you have to be at or below 80% of income for your household to qualify. Uh, of course, it asks you for the county. Can anyone in the household demonstrate that you're at risk of homelessness 
or housing instability due to this? Well, obviously, if you're behind in rent uh, considerably, if you're up for eviction, if you're in any number of cases, uh, very well, you are going to be able to demonstrate that you're either at risk of homelessness or you are at risk of housing instability. Pretty much all of the reasons you would be seeking payment from this program uh, probably qualify you for that. Has anyone uh, in the household experienced uh, financial losses due to COVID-19? That could be reductions of income. It's, it's actually financial impact. It could be reductions of income, increases in costs. Uh, you could have had someone who's gotten COVID or you may not be able to work because of a, a, a particularly vulnerable person in your household or yourself. Uh, those are the, some of the reasons that uh, that you would be able to be eligible for this particular tranche of money. So the, uh, the federal government actually passed two different relief bills. ERA-1 is the one we're working on now. And in that statute passed by your Congress, it says that the individual must be able to demonstrate that their, uh, their inability to pay rent is due to COVID-19 in some way. Again, we've tried to make that bar very low. We understand that almost everybody was impacted by COVID-19. So uh, we're not requiring a lot of heavy duty documentation here, just uh, you to, to tell us how it impacted you. Um, and then of course, it's gonna tell you, if you're in Davidson, Rutherford, Knox or Shelby County, stop. There's no, no need to go any further in this application. The only reason we brought you to here is so that we can make sure to pass your name on to those other programs if you're in one of those counties and ineligible for our program. If you're in one of those counties, we are not going to be able to pay you from our program. That's important to know. Um, have you recently re received an eviction, papers for an eviction? That's important. That uh, uh, Cases who are currently under eviction get priority. Uh, it talks about your, your landlord here. These are the, just the other eligibility questions. They're very straightforward. You notice there's not a lot of documents to do and they're all yes and no answers. It's just, yes, that applies to me or no, it doesn't. Um, uh, Any one no may not necessarily make you ineligible. So make sure that you answer these truthfully and honestly. This is just to establish upfront uh, that you are uh, eligible under the basic requirements of this program. Now we're going to get to the application portion. It's going to ask you the basic information, your, your name, your home address, what county do you live in? Uh, what kind of property do you live in? A single family home? Is it an apartment? Is it a duplex? Uh, things, things like that. These are just going to be very straightforward questions about, uh, about your situation. So there's not a lot of donning information here to follow. Uh, telephone number, obviously. Uh, the individual listed in the, in the residence of the household. So you want to list the people that live in your house. There's a number of things here we're going to ask for. And you can see then it's complete. That's the primary portion of the application. Now, that's not the end. That's just the information. Uh, but that does get you the basic application completed. And then we're going to ask you to list your household members. Uh, you're going to complete that and move forward. We're going to talk about income verification. And here's different documents that you're going to uh, possibly use to verify your income. It can be just your uh, 2020 IRS 1040, your final tax return that you submit with this showing that your income was at or below 80%. You can also use um, two months of pay stubs to do it. You can use a, a, your social security disability letter. You can use uh, other program disability letters. There's a zero income attestation piece that you can use showing that you just don't have uh, any more income. So there's several options in the way you're gonna verify your income. You're gonna list your income as well. Uh, we are working on, this is one of the improvements we hope we'll be able to make based on uh, treasury guidance that just came out. Uh, we're hoping that if you don't have the documentation or can't provide it, we'll be able to accept what they call self-attestation or your ability to just say, yes, that is. We don't have that yet. We're waiting. We just got the guidance from treasury and we're working out to see exactly what they're going to require uh, for that to be eligible. But we are working toward that. There's going to be a household income certification method. 
and you can see down there, you can put in your 2020 uh, 1040 taxes or other document uh, that, that might work for that. Here's where the income verification is gonna happen. This is gonna tell you what the income limits are in your county based on the county that you've put down as your residence uh, and your total combined income that you have, uh, that you have uh, told us in the application, what your household income is. And right here, we'll tell you whether or not you're going to be eligible based on the 80% or less area median income rule that was written into the federal statute. Here's where we're gonna talk about COVID hardship. It gives you an opportunity of many things you might check off that we thought would be evidence of COVID hardship. Again, you're just gonna, it's an attestation, you're gonna say that. And then down here, if you select other, we're gonna ask you if it's not in this list, uh, there could be something we didn't think of, uh, just to tell us what it is. And obviously if it's a qualifying event, uh, we're gonna accept that. Uh, just important that you, uh, you're able to fill this out. There's also a place down here at E3 where you talk about your loss of income or increases of costs as to why you're not able to pay your rent. We're just looking for a short statement from you explaining to us what's happened in your situation that's made uh, this difficult for you during this time. Then the assistance for request. We're simply asking you, what do you owe the landlord? We need to know so we can figure out what your assistance needs to be. Uh, then, so you're going to tell us how much your current monthly rent is. You're going to tell us the month starting all the way back with March of 2020, if you're past due back that far, amounts that you are currently past due for those months. We're going to ask you for your landlord name and their address and the landlord's phone number. And if you have it, the landlord's email. Um, we understand you may not have the landlord's email, but we need you to give us as much information as you can, because we're going to try to, uh, get that landlord if they haven't already filled out an application to go ahead and do one. If they have, then those applications are gonna be joined up based on what you enter here uh, is who the landlord is. We'll be able to chase that landlord uh, down in the system and make sure that your application gets married to it so that it can get paid as quickly as possible. This is just the second page of that. As you can see, it comes all the way up through, actually goes through December, 2021 right now, but you would fill in the months all the way up now, all the way up to potentially um, September. Uh, we, uh, of this, since September is uh, one day away uh, for you to enter that. So, and then if there are late fees or penalties or court costs, you're gonna put those down here in the bottom. If the landlord's added that to your bill and said, hey, you owe $500 in late fees, make sure you put that on there so that we can pay that. That was a question that came up in uh, when Cynthia was giving her presentation. Uh, late fees are eligible expenses as well as court costs. And we wanna be able to pay those, but we can't pay them if we don't know about them. And we've had cases where we've already paid all the rent and we've paid out everything. And then the landlord still says, oh, but what about these late fees when the tenant says that? We try to give us as much about that as you can in the front. We're also gonna ask the landlord to make sure they provide with information about everything that is owed during the eligible period. The utility assistance component, very similar. There's one for the water company, one for gas or propane, one for electric. Uh, you're just going to tell us past due amounts. We're going to ask you to support that with the latest utility bill that you have. It's fairly straightforward. Uh, it's nothing, there's, there's not anything else you have to provide us. Uh, we're going to ask you to upload that latest utility bill, as I say. Very simple. When I say upload, it's as simple as if you're doing it on a phone, taking a picture of it with your phone. You don't have to go to, to Kinko or some uh, office somewhere or get somebody to do it for you. If you've got a cell phone with a camera, you can just simply take a picture. And if you're doing the application on your phone, it will let you just upload it straight from your phone. Or you can sign back in from your phone and upload those pictures from the phone for those documents. And we are doing the best we can to reduce the number of documents that you're going to be required to upload. Uh, again, keep in mind, we are following a federal law that has passed by Congress and the rules laid out by Treasury. So we're not making any of this up in the state. We're, we're actually trying to interpret this down to the lowest possible requirement, um, but we are having to follow the requirements that were laid out by the federal government. 
there's a second page, same thing, utility assistance that'll take you all the way up to the current time so that we can make sure we cover any arrears. Now, utility assistance at this point, we're only paying arrears on, uh, so only late amounts. But it's important to know that this is a live document. So you get up to, as Cynthia said, up to 12 and potentially 15 months of assistance, total assistance. So if you claim, ask for the arrears money now, you're going to come back in for recertification. And if you're behind again or have arrears at that point in time, you will be able to put those in as well uh, at that time. So initially, you're going to be able to, to ask for up to 12 months of arrears and potentially three months of prospective rent or your future rent. Uh, so it could go in that in that scenario up to 15 total months. So you just need to remember that the total assistance is going to be a combined of 15 months. So that can be any combination of arrears and future rent. This is for other utility assistance, and that could be things like um, uh, there, there are some things that are eligible, some things are not, but you might have fuel oil, let's say. You might have heating wood, uh, things of that nature. So you, uh, internet is not eligible right now uh, for this. And of course, telephone is not eligible. Here we're gonna ask you about any other assistance you've already received, whether it was from THDA or local organization, the city that you live in, the county that you live in, we're just going to ask you to tell us what that was. Here's where we're going to talk about the required documentation. We need we need a, a government issued ID of some kind uh, for the applicant on the lease. We need the most recent rent statement that shows us uh, that, that obviously that's where you live. A copy of the lease agreement or a written agreement or two rent receipts. So if you if you don't have a lease, but your landlord gives you a receipt every month, you can just give us the two rent receipts, the two most recent rent receipts to show us, uh, document that you obviously are renting there. Then there's the certification and submit. This is just saying, if you go through it section by section, that one, that you're the tenant that you certified everything that you put in this application, that the things that you put in here are true to the best of your knowledge. Uh, that So it, it acts as an attestation of this, talks about the limits of assistance, just explains, you know, what, how much assistance we can provide, talks about the fact that we have to have the landlord's participation. We can't do this without participation of both, with a few exceptions, as Cynthia said, in cases where it's going through the court system, uh, or through uh, legal aid or something like that, we do have some exceptions that we can do that. And we're working on other ways to try to make this even more available as we go forward. So it's important to know that. It talks about the recapture of funds, meaning that if we pay out funds that, that truly weren't eligible and find out later that uh, uh, the landlord, the, all these payments typically are going to the landlord are gonna have to be paid back to uh, THDA, ultimately to the US Treasury. And then it talks about your tenant obligations here. Uh, just says that you're going to inform us of any changes. You're going to make sure that we're you're giving us accurate and correct information, um, and it and that you understand that making these rental payments um, as of the next due date. That we're trying to make those of the next due date and potentially up to three months in the future. There's a, a talks about just judicial enforcement is eligible talks about what the law is down here. And then you're going to check and say, by submitting this, I'm going to acknowledge that all this is true. Uh, it's true and accurate and complete to the best of my knowledge. So that's going to be very important. That is the tenant application. I just went through the whole thing. So as you can see, it's not nearly as daunting as I think we were, where some folks are saying maybe out there. Uh, so don't believe what you hear, only believe what you see is all I can say. Go in and check it for yourself. So that's going to be very important. That's the tenant application. Uh, now, to address one of the questions then, how fat long does it take for this to get paid? When there is a completed tenant and landlord application, meaning it's, we have an application and all the required documentation from both the tenant and landlord, it's going to take three weeks or less. It's fairly straightforward. Just keep that in mind. 
Um, if it's lasted longer than that's because we're not getting the documentation we need. Somebody's not participating, uh, but we are trying to close the window on those very quickly as well. So uh, we're going to continue to work on that. As I said from the beginning, this is a huge program started up very quickly. A lot of folks to serve. So we are uh, we are solving problems almost on a daily basis. From the tenant side, as you can see, um, this is, I mean, the landlord side. So this is the landlord application. They will start here. Uh, they're going to put in their basic information, your name, their tenant's name, and they can, they can have one case and multiple tenants. So they're going to do this for each of their tenants. Tells them what documents they're going to need. It's not a lot. They need a W-9, which is normal for any business. They need to show proof of ownership and actually we will uh, if they don't have something we will look that up on the state uh, property database to make sure they're the owner uh, notice of the management agreement if they have a third party manager uh, a lease or written agreement or again some rent roll we ask for the rent roll uh, as well so sometimes if there's not a lease and we have a rent roll and you have adequate there's enough for us to show with fairly good um, confidence that you are renting them and you're, you're renting and you're paying rent and this is how much rent you're paying. That's really all we're gonna require. There's a statement down here saying that, that this is true to their best of their knowledge and it's not fraudulent. Uh, they're not gonna submit fraudulent documents or statements. Talks about reasonable accommodation, fair housing, suspected fraud, report fraud, general program questions here, complete and continue. Here's where they're gonna put in their information. As you can see, it's very, very straightforward. Just again, their name, address, uh, their email address, a DUNS number if they have it. If they have a federal ID number, we need that. That's required in the statute. Uh, if there's an alternate contact name, we ask for that. Uh, we ask for these documents. And these are the ones I already read about the proof of ownership. This is where they would provide those to us uh, as well. Then this is their submit. Same thing that you saw in the tenant application. The statement saying, this, this is all this uh, that I have, I agree to and I accept. And these are true statements to the best of my knowledge. I am going to submit in this and everything I'm submitting to you is the truth. And it's accurate to the best of my knowledge. And they're going to click complete and submit here. And when they do, they're done. That's the, the landlord application. It is very short. Most landlords can fill that out in just a few minutes. So it's very important to know that this is not a long and daunting process, particularly if you take a minute, uh, whether it's the tenant or landlord, just to see what information is needed before you start. Uh, this could literally be done in a matter of, even for the tenant side, in, in 10 or 15, 20 minutes, if you have your documents ready. And if everybody submits everything, signs everything, and they submit the documents that are required, this will go straight through and it'll get paid within three weeks or so. Uh, it, the the holdup is always because we don't have the information that we, we have to have that we're required to get, again, to pass these through. But we are working on reducing the document requirements. We're, we're, we're following the Treasury guidance to see the best way we can possibly do that. So with that, I am. Uh, that's the end of kind of the walkthrough of the, of the application for both parties. And uh, as uh, Cynthia said, I think Cynthia, you've probably been answering questions as you go. And uh, Anna Louise has decided, said that we'll answer them at a later time based on they're going to get a record of them. I was just about to share, Bill. Uh, yeah, I've been responding to as many as I can. But I think to be respectful of everyone's time, that it'd be easier for us to just continue to respond throughout the day. So I appreciate everyone's comments and feedbacks and questions. We'll continue to respond to them as soon as we can. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you both so much. And yes, there was a flurry of activity in the chat. So I just wanna reiterate that um, you will be able to, to see those. Um, great, sorry, we're having a, we're improving some of our uh, tech stuff um, in the background while we're, the presentations are going on. So um, a couple of announcements before we move on to the next presentation by our colleagues at DHS is that now um, 
We are also, um, if you have coworkers or colleagues or friends who are not able to register, um, we are live streaming it on YouTube. Um, there's an Access to Justice YouTube channel. Um, it's Justice for All TN. So, um, and it's also on our Facebook um, page, which is Justice for All TN. So you can direct um, others to that. Um, and then also we have um, enabled the closed captioning in Zoom. Um, so if you need that service, um, you should have that at the bottom of your screen um, to click on closed captioning. And then uh, you will be able to, um, uh, to, to show that, to hide that if you don't want to see it. Um, and there's some other settings, <laughs> excuse me, of your own that you can use. So um, I wanted to make those announcements before we move on to the next segment. Um, we are going to hear now from, again, our, our colleagues at um, DHS. We have Michelle Joyner. She is the Policy and Research Coordinator, with the Tennessee Department of Human Services, and then also Charles Bryson. He is the Assistant Commissioner for the Family Assistance and Child Support with, um, again, the Tennessee Department of Human Services. So I'm going to be um, running their slide deck. So just give me one second to pull that up and then we'll get started. All right. Thank you so much, Anne Louise. And thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, Assistant Commissioner Bryce and I are both very excited to be here to chat with you today about some DHS eviction prevention resources that are available through some of our programs and some programs that are um, coming up on the horizon. You can go ahead and advance the next slide. So just a high level kind of overview of what we're going to go through today. Um, we're gonna to talk about some family assistance programs, specifically TANF and the SNAP program. We're gonna highlight some of our community partners and um, discuss as well some community services block grant resources that are available through some of those partner organizations. And then lastly, we're going to do um, a high level introductory overview of the TANF Opportunity Act, where there are some exciting funding opportunities that could be used to leverage um, existing resources Resources and develop new solutions to help prevent evictions in communities. And so with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Assistant Commissioner Bryson. Hello, I'm Charles Bryson, Assistant Commissioner for Family Assistance and Child Support with the department. Uh, it's nice to be here today. We appreciate the opportunity um, to, to talk with you and we can advance to the next slide if that's possible and the next one. Uh, we, we have been really working at the department to uh, focus on um, how to provide family-centered services, really using a, a whole family approach. And so uh, we have been working with our workers across the state. We have offices in every county uh, and we provide services to assist families, uh, really looking at the whole family and how we can assist in, in that manner um, uh, as we move forward. And we can move to the next slide. Uh, one of the ways that I think we could uh, be of assistance, especially through the TANF program, is um, uh, that we uh, are able to offer assistance for families with uh, transportation, um, education, and really trying to um, overcome barriers to employment to become employed. And we have worked. Uh, tirelessly over the last few years to make sure that uh, our processes are set up in a way that are easy to assess and people can um, apply online, upload information online, and um, we will um, be able to talk with people over the phone uh, and assist in that way, in addition to in the office when, when needed. Next slide. For, for the TANF program, there is one area that could be of assistance for families with uh, issues related to eviction, and that would be the diversion program. And that allows for families to ask to receive uh, the TANF benefit uh, as a one-time benefit uh, for needs that may exist within the family at that time. So this is an, an avenue that sometimes is uh, beneficial to families when they have a certain need that would require a lump sum payment and this would allow us to the opportunity to, to assist during that time. Next slide. 
we, we of course operate the SNAP program, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, and we are continuing to watch for and work uh, through um, as much as possible uh, to provide uh, assistance to families in ways that can be beneficial to families. And we um, are doing a lot of our work uh, based on phone conversations with families um, through upload and, and other avenues there as well. We continue to explore waivers within the SNAP program and uh, have been providing for uh, assistance as we can. Um, we also know that during the times of disaster there are certain uh, things that we can do through the SNAP disaster uh, benefits. And so we work uh, to make sure that we have those available when we can in areas where they're needed. And we've uh, also addressed the technology needs uh, in, in that so that families can uh, um, be able to access those services as well uh, by calling or uh, online, or we will have people uh, in, in those communities as well. Next slide. We, we, as I mentioned before, we really worked across the state to um, modernize the way and our approach to service delivery within our offices. And so um, families no longer um, need to sit in the lobby or wait on um, assistance within our offices. We have really worked to move towards an easier um, service deliver mo delivery model for families so that they can um, uh, get to us easier and that we can assist. And so there are many avenues for families. We uh, have um, virtual chat now um, and we, so that families can receive uh, information about the program 24 seven. We have resource guides that are available uh, online and we have really worked to um, modernize the way that uh, we receive verifications or um, work through interviews so that uh, we've tried to make it as easy as possible either through upload uh, by taking a picture on a smartphone, filling out online when possible, or, or coming to the office if there are needs to, uh, to come to the office as we are located in, in every county. Next slide, please. We just wanted to highlight a few of our partner programs that really have high impact for uh, families uh, facing eviction. United Way of, of Greater Nashville uh, has the Rapid Rehousing Program and um, works very closely to work to help stabilize families with wraparound services. Uh, the Methodist Labonner uh, Green and Healthy Homes Initiative uh, in West Tennessee offering available uh, assistance for uh, housing. And then of course, Tennessee Alliance for Legal Services uh, that provides rapid legal services for, for clients and, and housing issues. And we've seen uh, great success with these partner agencies and, and the work that they uh, do and appreciate very much our partnership with them and what they do to serve uh, customers and, and families within Tennessee. And I think with this, I will hand it back to Michelle to uh, cover some additional areas that could be helpful from the department's perspective. All right, thanks so much, Charles. If you could go to the next slide and then the next slide for me, Annalise. So in addition to the programs that Charles discussed, we want to also bring your attention to a variety of resources that are not delivered directly by DHS, but are funded through the Community Services Block Grant or CSBG. And the um, Community Services Block Grant is a federal grant program that is administered by DHS at the state level. And its purpose is to reduce poverty, revitalize low-income communities and empower low-income families to become fully self-sufficient. Its purpose differs from most other grants because it doesn't focus on funding a particular service or function solely as a standalone program. Instead, funds are used to provide a range of services and activities that have a measurable and potentially major impact on the causes of poverty in communities. So among the services and activities um, are those that are designed to assist low-income folks with obtaining and maintaining adequate housing and obtaining emergency assistance to meet urgent individual and family needs, which is, of course, particularly relevant for our discussion today. Um, but those services also support things like securing and retaining employment, attaining adequate education, and much, much more. And CSBG really provides the flexibility to meet and fill in gaps for community needs as determined by those communities themselves. Next slide. So DHS administers the Community Services Block Grant through a network of 20 local partners, which are shown here on the map. And these local community partners cover all of Tennessee's 95 counties. And in 2020, the partner agency shown here served over 332,000 individuals and almost 170,000 households using CSBG funding. 
And you'll, you'll see here um, on the version of this slideshow that you're able to download, there are actually two links on this slide. Um, the one on the left will take you to our website where you can view this map along with service areas um, for each of these um, partner agencies. And the link to the right um, will actually take contact list so that you can um, reach out to these organizations if you think that they have something that you'd like to learn more about. Next slide. So I mentioned earlier that the Community Services Block Grant provides flexibility to meet community needs as determined by communities. And the services and programs do vary by area based on locally identified needs that are determined by local agencies that connect their services and strategies to the 10 CSBG domains that you see listed here. And we've highlighted those that are particularly relevant for today's convening. And every three years, all CSBG partner agencies conduct and submit a community needs assessment. And the purpose of that assessment is to identify the greatest unmet poverty related needs and the gaps in services for low income individuals and families and communities. And to also ensure that agencies are directing and adjusting their services regularly in response to the changing needs of the community. Partner agencies also engage in strategic planning to prioritize, identify community needs, develop and establish goals and action steps related to those needs, and then develop annual community action plans that align with both their agency's mission, vision, and goals, as well as the state and DHS's priorities. Next slide. Additionally, um, our partner agencies received access to $19 million in supplemental CSBG funding through the CARES Act to support community responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. And these partner agencies were required to update those community action plans that I mentioned a moment ago with information about community needs that emerged during the pandemic and the actions that they were going to undertake in response to those needs. And the trends that we saw emerge relative to those needs are shown here, again, with those areas of interest for today's conversations, uh, once again, highlighted. So to date, CSBG partner agencies have expended approximately five and a half million dollars and our agencies are continually looking for ways to provide additional resources to the community using these funds. A little over $8 million of the CARE supplemental funding that Tennessee received has been allocated directly to housing needs, providing rental assistance, mortgage assistance, utility assistance, and housing and homelessness assistance. Next slide, please. I know that you'll be hearing a bit more about some of this work in more detail from partners like Metro Action Commission who are also on the call, but I did wanna highlight a few agencies that are doing this work in local communities across the state, starting with the Shelby County Community Service Agency, which um, operates a rent and mortgage program that has served Shelby County residents for over 40 years and continues to expand and evolve. In the last five years, they prevented almost 22,000 Shelby County residents from eviction or foreclosure. And in response to COVID, their program is covering the cost of three months rent or mortgage payments or up to $5,000, whichever is less, to landlords and mortgage companies for payments in arrears and or for future rent and mortgage payments. Um, they're braiding our CSBG funding with Shelby County Government Cares Act funds to support the creation of an emergency eviction settlement fund. And they're subcontracting with Catholic Charities of West Tennessee to provide emergency housing for folks via hotel stays and case management services to assist clients with attaining stable housing, among other activities. And the Shelby County Community Service Agency also has a utility assistance program, which has been working hand in hand with their rent and mortgage program since the early 70s. In the last five years, that program has provided over 117,000 families with utility assistance. Next up, we have the Metro Action Commission, whose care services include rent deposits, utilities deposits, and property tax assistance for low-income individuals and families that have been impacted by COVID-19. And MAC also provides an emergency assistance program that assists folks who've experienced a loss of income within the last 60 days with rent or mortgage payments, water, electric, prescriptions, special diet foods that might be recommended by a doctor, medical supplies, as well as delinquent property tax payments. They also have a senior services program that provides the same resources for senior citizens age 65 and older and a homeless services program, which provides assistance with deposits for things like rent, electric and water for individuals that have secured housing after being homeless. And lastly, I just wanted to briefly highlight the Upper East Tennessee Human Development Agency, which is utilizing a large portion of their CSBG CARES Act funding to expand the crisis and emergency services offered through their regular CSBG programs to benefit those directly impacted by the pandemic, as well as their homeless client services and crisis emergency services under their regular housing program. Next slide. 
you're interested in learning more about these resources, I encourage you to contact our DHS CSBG team using the contact information shown here or to visit the DHS website. Um, we'll also again have that contact list linked in this um, slideshow in case you want to directly reach out to any of the agencies in your areas. And then if you can move to the next slide, we will try to quickly um, touch on the last piece of our presentation this morning. So in the spirit of collaborative efforts to solve complex problems, we really didn't want to miss the opportunity to just quickly share with you information about the TANF Opportunity Act, which Commissioner Carter referenced earlier, and which has some exciting funding opportunities that can be leveraged to develop additional resources to support families that are facing eviction. Next slide, please. So we like to start conversations about the TANF Opportunity Act and the Tennessee Opportunity Pilot Program by highlighting some of the flaws with the current safety net system, which are illustrated well by the graphic that you see here. This is a map of the 80 plus federal programs that collectively spend over a trillion dollars each year trying to effectively meet the needs of vulnerable individuals and families. As you can see, this is a lot. It's a lot to manage as a practitioner, um, certainly as a policymaker, and then obviously as an individual person who might be in need of assistance. The system is difficult to navigate, due in large part to lack of a shared vision. It tends to be program-centric rather than person-centric, transactional rather than relational, and siloed rather than cohesive and coordinated. And collectively, we tend to measure outcomes like the number of people served rather than outcomes, like whether or not they've actually been able to move out of a place of crisis. So the TANF Opportunity Act will work to address this by implementing a shared vision for redesigning the safety net with the idea that the safety net should be a mile marker in life's journey rather than a destination unto itself. And our sort of shared vision overall is to really grow the capacity of families to reduce their dependency on public benefits and services. Next slide, please. So the TANF Opportunity Act, which was signed into law earlier this summer, allocates approximately $180 million in TANF funds for innovative pilot programs that aim to transform the lives of Tennesseans living in poverty. And to facilitate this transformation, the Act established a 21-member Families First Community Advisory Board, which includes representation from state agencies and local government, as well as nonprofits, faith-based organizations, business community, and current and former TANF customers, among others. And this board will oversee the administration of those grant funds that I mentioned earlier and be the body that selects both the planning and implementation grantees that will support the development and launch of the Tennessee Opportunity Pilot Program. And through the pilots, Tennessee will be able to demonstrate with measurable data strategies that are most effective at reducing dependency and growing capacity of our most vulnerable citizens. We believe that if we partner with communities and organizations to plan, implement, and closely monitor the outcomes of these pilots, that our collective work will be some of the most impactful and transformative ever done in the social services, social services space. Next slide, please. So through the implementation of the TANF Opportunity Act, $5 million will be awarded through, through up to 50 planning grants that will assist community partners with technical assistance, visioning, program design, budgeting, and partnership development for the Tennessee Opportunity Pilot Program proposals that will address at least one of the four purposes of the TANF program. And those purposes are to provide assistance to needy families with children so that they can live in their own homes or in the homes of relatives, and the dependence of needy families on government benefits through work, job preparation, and marriage, reduce out-of-wedlock pregnancies, and then lastly, encourage the formation and maintenance of two-parent families. So as I mentioned, the advisory board, the advisory board can award up to $500,000 per grant, no earlier than October 1st of this year. And the application period actually opens tomorrow, September 1st, and it'll close on September 30th. Grantees who are awarded planning grants will have three months to complete proposals for the pilot. And there are four types of entities that are eligible to apply for planning grants, um, political subdivisions of the state, nonprofit corporations, created pursuant to Title 48, um, development districts that are created pursuant to the Development District Act of 1965, and human resources agencies, which are created pursuant to the Human Resource Agency Act of 1973. Next slide. From the Tennessee Opportunity Pilot proposals completed by planning grantees, the advisory board will then select six pilots with two in each grant division across the state. And then there'll be an additional pilot that's operated by DHS. 
And these implementation grants will provide $25 million per pilot over three years and demonstrate the effectiveness of growing capacity to reduce dependency. The pilots will require collaboration and collective impact efforts to really provide comprehensive support and wraparound services for families. And those will be selected by May 1st of next year. Next slide. So I have um, a few key dates and sort of next steps for folks who might be interested in learning more about this particular opportunity. I've also linked here to um, our website where we have a ton of great information about the TANF Opportunity Act. Also, um, this is where we'll house the actual um, application link. And um, you can also sign up for emails about the TANF Opportunity Act and the Opportunity Pilots if you wanna stay in the loop about this work. Next slide. I know that we have thrown a lot of information at you in a very short amount of time. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us with any questions that you have. And thank you very much for having us. Thank you so much, Michelle and Charles. Um, that was a lot of wonderful information. And just to let everyone know, that is going to be available, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Dropbox link. We'll add all the slides um, immediately following the presentation today. Um, we are just about five minutes behind, but we are gonna go ahead and take a 10 minute break. I know everyone has been sitting for a, for a while. So if you will come back at, um, 11.05, please. And just a reminder, we are live streaming. So um, please make sure you have your cameras and uh, your, your mics off. So that's just not picked up um, during the break. But we are going to, again, step away for 10 minutes and we will get back going at 11.05 Central. Thank you, everybody.
All right, everybody, this is a one minute warning. Okay, I've got 11.05 Central. So we'll go ahead and get back with our program. So next we are going to hear from, first we are going to hear from um, Jennifer Prusak. She is an Associate Clinical Professor of Law and the Director of the Housing Law Clinic at Vanderbilt Law School. And um, right after um, Professor Prusak, we're going to hear from Ann Pruitt. She is the Executive Director at the Tennessee Alliance for Legal Services. And uh, if you follow along in your agenda, you'll they're going to you'll see the topics that they are going to cover and um, resources that they are going to share with the group that are beneficial to both tenants and landlords. So, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Prusak. Good morning, everybody. Uh, let me get my slides up here. Uh, my name is Jennifer Prusak, and I am the director of uh, the, Vander the Housing Law Clinic at Vanderbilt University Law School. Our mission is to reduce housing insecurity throughout Tennessee through advocacy, education, and outreach. Uh, this morning, I'll be spending some time outlining some of the main rights and responsibilities of both landlords and tenants under Tennessee law. As any of you who, who work in this realm can attest, this is a huge topic, could easily take up an entire morning, if not an entire day. Um, I'm going to be lim limiting my comments to about 25 minutes first, because that's how much time I was given. Uh, but secondly, I've learned that speaking for more than 20, 25 minutes about any legal topic is going to lose you your audience really fast. So in the interest of keeping everybody uh, with me, I'm going to limit to 25 minutes because of that. That of necessity, I'm limiting uh, my slides and my comments to uh, the topics that we see most frequently in the housing law clinic. Uh, the odds are very high that I will not get to every question or concern that people have today. Um, if I do not address what you're curious about, please put a note in the uh, chat box. To the extent time allows, I will address that at the end of my presentation. Uh, more likely, however, I, I, I encourage you to email me at the email address on that slide. Um, depending on the situation, the housing clinic may be able to advise you or put you in touch with resources that can. Okay, so Getting first off, uh, this is not news to most of you, um, but before I start talking about rights and responsibilities of landlords and tenants, I have to, you know, make sure everybody who's listening knows that uh, on August 26th, Thursday of last week, uh, the Supreme Court struck down the Biden administration's eviction moratorium. Um, it hadn't been, uh, most of Tennessee, uh, the Western District of Tennessee had not been bound by the moratorium in some time. Uh, the rest of Tennessee hadn't been bound by it since late July, but now the entire country is on the same page. Evictions for non-payment of rent can go forward again in Tennessee, across the country. And so landlords who are behind on rent or feel they're behind on rent can proceed uh, as they did before. Um, there are so many topics and I've had to learn what I'm gonna be talking about. Um, I am going to start out by um, providing a roadmap of what we're gonna be covering today. Um, I made some edits to these slides. The very first 
thing that we're going to be talking about, and I'm not sure why that didn't make it into these slides. We're going to be talking a little bit about tenants' obligations under their leases. So that should be number one with an asterisk over it uh, above URLTA. Uh, secondly, I'm going to be briefly defining what URLTA is, what the Uniform Residential Landlord and Tenant Act is, where it applies and where it doesn't apply in Tennessee. I'm going to be talking about evictions, landlord, uh, landlord and tenant rights, procedures and obligations, as well as um, I'm going to be addressing tenants' rights and landlord responsibilities with respect to habitability issues in the units. Okay, so first, tenant obligations. When a tenant enters into a lease agreement with a landlord, the tenants in every county in Tennessee automatically agrees to the following. They must abide by the terms of the lease, including paying rent on time and paying any fee, late fees if rent is late. They must abide by any pet policies. They must abide by basically anything that the lease says they have to do, they have to do that. Um, they have to abide by the law. They can't engage in any criminal activity um, on the premises that endangers others. And they need to keep the unit in a safe and habitable, clean condition. If a landlord, if sorry, if a tenant fails to abide by any of these requirements, it can give the landlord the right to uh, file a detainer warrant against you and evict you. Briefly, an introduction to uh, the Uniform Residential Landlord and Tenant Act, as I mentioned earlier. Um, when you're talking about landlord and tenant rights and responsibilities in Tennessee, the first question really that you need to ask is whether URLTA applies or not, because there are different rights and responsibilities granted to landlords and tenants depending on whether or not this act applies or if Tennessee law applies. Um, in a very, very, very abbreviated nutshell, and this is, does not do justice to the, the, all of the differences between these two sources of law, um, URLTA provides some extra protection for tenants. Uh, it's a lot more complicated than that, but that's sort of the one main takeaway I'd like you to get. Um, and the URLTA applies in all Tennessee counties that have 75,000 or more inhabitants. I listed the counties below. Um, I, if I, if I, uh, if, if you think I have this wrong, you know, follow up with me after, but my understanding is all of these counties in Tennessee have the requisite number of people for UL, URLTA to apply. All of the other counties, the counties that have fewer people, the more rural counties, Tennessee law applies. And so if you are a landlord or a tenant who is looking to protect their rights and wants to know what their obligations are, I urge you to figure out first which set of laws applies to your situation because it's different. So we talked about tenant obligations, what they are under the lease. They have to pay rent. They have to abide by all the terms of the lease. There are other things they must do. If a tenant does not abide by material provisions of their leases, now that the eviction moratorium no longer applies, the landlord has the right to bring them to court for uh, to, to um, further their rights. And so there are a large, there's a lot of obligations, there are a lot of requirements that landlords need to follow in order to bring an eviction properly and not have it dismissed. If any of these requirements are not met, the tenant can raise them at the eviction hearing and possibly successfully get the eviction dismissed. So what I'm about to tell you is really very much advice for both landlords and tenants. Everybody who's listening to this, if you want to protect your rights under the lease, you need to pay attention to making sure you get all your ducks in a row or you're going to not be able to, to protect them. So um, the first thing, there, there's basically three different uh, categories you need to pay attention to. The first is um, what happens before the case goes to court. And there are several obligations that the landlord needs to, to 
follow, some requirements before the case can go to court. And the biggest of these is they need to make sure that the tenant is has proper notice that they are being asked to vacate the unit. Um, tenants, if the, the landlord does not follow the correct procedures, you can raise that at the hearing and possibly get the case dismissed. Landlords, if you want to be able to protect what you feel are your claims, definitely at the outset, when you're, you need to look up the steps and make sure that you have everything in order. So there are different lengths of time required for landlords to notify their tenants that they want them to vacate. And it depends entirely on the reason for the eviction. So in situations where there has been, uh, you know, the, the tenant, if, if the landlord feels that the tenant is engaging in acts that endanger the safety of others, they are only required to provide three days notice. If it's a material breach of the lease, for example, the tenant is behind on rent, 14 days are required. If the lease term is at an end and the landlord does not wish to renew, the landlord needs to provide 30 days written notice to tenants. There doesn't need to be a reason given. There's nothing under the law that requires, with, with exceptions, you know, uh, barring discrimination and other things um they need to provide third and there are some instances uh for better or worse where no notice is required at all if the tenant has signed a lease that specifically says i have waived my right to being notified of this eviction before it is filed it has to be affirmatively waived in writing in the lease then no notice may be required um, that was a mouthful and probably hard to re retain your memory. So everybody who's party to an eviction, um, if you're going to court or if you're being brought to court, make sure the notice has been has is proper. Um, the form of notice it needs to be in writing, and it can be as formally done as a certified letter to your tenant, or as informal as a note attached or taped to their door. Um, so that is what needs to happen before court. If at the end of that notice period, the tenant has not vacated the unit, then the landlord has the right to file for a detainer warrant in court. And so I'm gonna briefly go over those procedures. Um, tenant has not vacated by the date provided in the written notice. The landlord then may file a detainer warrant in general sessions, and the judge will set it for a hearing pursuant to its calendar. I, um, I things are, I, I know are quite hectic in general sessions right now. Um, I cannot say with certainty how far out uh, cases are being set once the detainer warrant is filed. I encourage you to follow up with judges, check the docket, um, but some, matter, some amount of time after the detainer warrant is filed, it will be set for a hearing. Um, I cannot stress enough that this hearing is the tenant's opportunity to provide any available defenses to the eviction, and I'll get to some of those in a minute. Um, there are lots of studies done that show, and you don't even need to do a study, you can just go to General Sessions Court and see this, a huge percentage of tenants do not show up to their eviction hearings. And there are a lot of reasons for this that I don't have time to go into today, um, but just a huge percentage of tenants don't even go to their eviction hearing. If you are a tenant advocate, either in the legal realm or you know, it, providing service to tenants. If one of the people that you are working with is being, you know, there's an unlawful detainer warrant and they need to show up to court for it, everything that can be done to get the tenant to court needs to be done. Because if they don't show up to that hearing, they automatically lose. They will receive 
a default judgment doesn't matter how much merit the landlord's claim has. They will receive a default judgment. They will have to leave their home. Um, you know, they need to show up for these hearings. And there are a lot of reasons why they don't show up. Um, but be that as it may, this is the tenant's opportunity to fight for their right to stay housed once it gets to that stage. Um, there are, so it's, um, Tennessee is a state where landlord tenant law definitely favors landlords, um, but there are defenses to evictions in Tennessee. Tenants do have rights. And I'm gonna highlight some of the, uh, some defenses that we see uh, most often are successful. First of all, show up to court. That's not a defense. That's just, you gotta do this if you wanna protect your rights. Um, one major defense is the tenant did not actually breach the lease. Either the tenant actually did pay rent and uh, there is a mistake in the landlord's accounting or if the landlord is alleging something other than non-payment of rent, the tenant didn't do it. Basically, it's basically saying, I did not do what the landlord says I did. So that's the first. Um, the second is notice, you know, the notice requirements that I laid out at the very beginning. Uh, the landlord, for whatever reason, didn't follow the steps that are required of them by, you know, the state of Tennessee and giving notice for the eviction. If that is what's happened, if the tenant never received notice and hadn't waived their right to notice, or the tenant wasn't, you know, acting in a way that was threatening to others, but only got three days, that can also be a defense. Um, the landlord will very likely, if they feel that there's still a breach of the lease going on, will likely refile it. But this, you know, is a defense to get possibly the case continued or dismissed. Um, the fair, impermissible discrimination. So the Fair Housing Act applies to Tennessee. Um, landlords are not permitted to discriminate against tenants based on uh, a variety of different categories. Um, the very specific categories, race, religion, country of origin, um, and some others, uh, discrimination does not mean my landlord has been mean to me. Like it, it needs to be something more concrete than that. But if you believe that your landlord is evicting you for retaliatory purposes or because of your race or ethnicity, um, that can potentially be a defense. And that's also something that you should, um, there are resources in the state of Tennessee to help you should that arise. Um, and then landlord fail to keep the unit in safe condition can potentially be something that can uh, add a wrinkle to the proceedings. Um, you know, the landlord does not, there are very specific things a landlord is required to do in Tennessee. There's a lot that the landlord is not obligated to do. Um, and I'm going to go into what they, what they are required to do by way of keeping a unit safe and what they are not required to do in a few minutes. But in a nutshell, if what is going on rises to the level of it is literally unsafe to live there, that could potentially be a defense. Uh, moving on, after the eviction, there's basically two outcomes. One, the tenant loses. Two, uh, the landlord loses. Um, so if the tenant loses, I'm sorry, if the tenant wins and the eviction is denied, they stay in the unit. They are not required to vacate. If the landlord wins and the judge says, yes, you are entitled to possession of your unit, the tenant will be given a period of time by the court to vote, to vacate. If usually a week, 10 days, something like that. If the tenant remains in the property at the end of that period, the landlord has the right to obtain a writ of possession from the courts and have the sheriff remove the tenant from the property. That said, the landlord may not remove the tenant from the premises before that period ends. So if the court says, yes, landlord, you are entitled to possession of the unit. Yes, we are evicting the tenant. The landlord still must wait until the end of the period of time the uh, renter is given by the court in order to um, get the writ of possession and remove them from the property. I want to briefly go over uh, some things that landlords are not permitted to do. Um, 
I will say that almost like the majority of landlords that I have worked with in Tennessee and I practiced in Indiana before moving here, the major, almost all the landlords I know get this, that they're not allowed to engage in self-help evictions. Um, but it does occur often enough that it's something I want to just sort of flag. So um, landlords are not permitted to lock tenants out. They're not allowed to engage in activities that effectively removes the tenant from the property before the court can issue a root of possession. So changing the locks on a tenant without having anything going on in court is not allowed. You're not to shut off utilities. You're not to, you know, it, you are you not to throw out tenants' possessions. Those are all impermissible in Tennessee law, even if the landlord has the right to regain possession of the unit. So if you are a landlord wanting to regain possession of the unit, go to the proper channels. Um, and if you are a tenant, and these things have happened to you, you have a right uh, of recourse and you should follow up with a legal aid organization or, uh, you know, another agency uh, because you not, that's not supposed to happen. Um, and then my last slide before I, I don't want to say adjourn, we're not in court, before I hand this over to Anne, um, we get a lot of questions in my clinic here at the law school about what landlords are required to do under Tennessee law by way of keeping the premises habitable. Um, lots and lots of questions. There's a lot of confusion over this issue, I think both from landlords and tenants perspective. And so I wanna highlight this a little bit. Um, I, I will say that most of the questions that we get in this clinic are from tenants who feel that their landlords are not keeping things up as nicely as they should. And while that may be the case, uh, it's, it's, I have not seen a lot of situations where Tennessee law or uh, URLTA provides remedies for the tenant. So I wanna highlight what the landlord must do. So in every county of Tennessee, in URLTA and non-URLTA counties, landlords, have the, they must keep rental units safe. They absolutely need to keep them safe for habitation. There needs to be heat in the winter. Uh, there's a certain temperature indoors below which units are not allowed to get. I wanna say it's 68 degrees, but I could be wrong. Um, there need to be utilities, there needs to be sewage, there needs to be plumbing. The basic things that keep a house or an apartment, a rental unit safe to live in. Um, that said, there are a fair number of things. So we get we get questions a lot from tenants saying things like, I, I keep having cockroaches or there's mold in my bathroom. Um, various things that while might be an indication that the unit is not kept up as well as it could have been, don't actually rise to something that provides remedies under Tennessee law. Um, if you are in a county where URLTA applies, so the more urban counties in Tennessee, the statute provides that tenants, they need to provide, tell the landlord in writing what's going on, and then they are allowed to get stuff fixed so that it is safe, and then deduct the cost of making those needed repairs from the amount they owe the landlord. So if your landlord is not providing heat in the winter or there's a sewage issue and they're not fixing it, the tenant may take it upon themselves to fix it after notifying their landlord in writing. And then if they spent $300, $400, $50, whatever, they may deduct that amount from the rent they owe the landlord. In counties where URLTA does not apply, the landlord has the same obligations, but the tenant may not deduct the amount of rent they're paying to the landlord. So they may, what they can do is they can file a complaint with the building inspector or the county public health department, um, but no, as my understanding is that no rent diversion is permitted. And so if you are, a tenant uh, who feels that, you know, I, I encourage you, if you are a landlord or a tenant to who, and you are worried about habitability issues, um, what I've explained in the past four minutes um, is a very, very, very brief overview 
Um, if you are a landlord unsure about what your responsibilities are, I encourage you to first determine if you are in an URLTA or non-URLTA county, and then figure out what that means for what you have to do. If you are a tenant, before you withhold your rent, you need to similarly look and see if what is wrong with the unit is something that uh, your specific county allows you to withhold rent for. Because if it's not, and you withhold rent, your landlord has the right under Tennessee law to pursue an eviction action against you. And if it's something relatively minor. I don't believe that air conditioning, for example, is something that landlords are required to provide. If you withhold rent and it's not something a landlord has to do, the landlord will have the right to pursue an eviction action against you. So I saw, I know there's a lot going on in the chat box. I have not had the ability to read comments that people have left. I encourage you uh, to, and I don't think actually I'm gonna have time to go through the comments and address them now. I encourage you to reach out to me, the Housing Law Clinic, uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, we work to reduce housing, uh, instability and uh, scare, you know, throughout Tennessee, through education, outreach and advocacy. Um, if my students and I don't have the resources to help with your specific question, we will do our best to point you in the direction of people who can. As you've heard this morning, there are lots of organizations and agencies throughout the state that are dedicated to helping landlords and tenants figure out their rights and making sure that they're upheld. Um, so that is my 25 minutes. Uh, Anne Pruitt from TALS is going to speak next about uh, some really incredible online resources that they have for folks who have legal questions relating to housing. Uh, Anne, are you ready to go? I am, thank you. Excellent, okay. Thank you all very much. Great. Thank you for bringing up my slides, Anne Louise. I'm Ann Pruitt with Tennessee Alliance for Legal Services. We are a statewide nonprofit that fo that's focused on strengthening the delivery of civil legal help to vulnerable Tennesseans. What we know is when people are facing barriers to their safety, security, stability, often there's a legal issue tangled up in that. And that's where we come in. You can go to the next slide, Anne Louise. If you have one takeaway from my remarks, it's Help for TN. That is our co-branded legal information portal and helpline that can be an entry point to people who are facing civil legal issues and don't know where to turn. So this is it. This is uh, a screenshot of helpfortn.org. And we've organized the content based on the most frequent questions we get on our civil legal helpline where we talk to about 5,000 Tennesseans annually. You'll see right now, no surprise, the top issues are COVID-related resources, eviction, and then um, divorce is our third, our third um, highest topic. You go to the next slide, Anne Louise. This is just um, a screenshot of some blogs. What we do also with our, our helpline data is we write blogs that address the top issues that we see. And I just wanna echo here um, what Commissioner Perry said that um, helping landlords remain solvent is a key to helping tenants remain housed and a key to us having affordable housing in our state. So one of the things you will see in the coming months from TALS is some blogs that are addressing the needs of landlords because we are getting swamped um, and we welcome them on our helpline um, for call with calls from landlords, particularly mom and pop landlords. So next, next slide, Anne Louise. I want to highlight uh, one of the resources that you can find um, on our on our housing related uh, page, and that's a chat bot. And it's a chat bot called the Renter Defender, who is a champion for renters rights. This is a conversational search. So instead of um, typing in your question, the chat bot will pop up and it can help you know your rights and responsibilities if you can't pay rent. Um, we have links to it'll ask you questions about your county. It's based on conditional logic. So you only get ask questions that are relative, relevant to your situation. And it will connect you to the THDA resources. It will connect you to our DHS partner 
resources all, all from here and all in a chat style instead of a search. And it's available in Spanish as well as English. Next slide, Anne Louise. Okay, so it really is as easy as one, two, three, right? You click a button, you complete an interview, and it's just a back and forth with the chat bot, and then you get answers. Um, it says forms here. One form that we have available is an appeal for Section 8 denial. We used to have the CDC um, moratorium letter, but that's that's been removed based on you know, updates in status. And you will be you'll receive an email that sends you your chat with the bot. So you've got a record of everything that was discussed and all the links that were relevant to your situation. Okay, next slide, Anne Louise. Okay, and this is the helpline that I mentioned. Um, we started this back in 2013. It's a toll-free state statewide helpline and how it works is you call in and you get scheduled for a 20 to 30 minute legal advice appointment with one of our attorneys. Right now, as I mentioned, housing is one of our top issues. It's open to anyone, um, anyone to call. The number is 1-844-435-7486. Remember it easily because it is um, help for TN. And please um, post questions in chat, call us. One thing I wanted to highlight also are legal clinics. Um, since COVID, we have done two or three uh, legal clinics for landlords and small business owners. And if you have a need or interest in that or want to organize one, you can reach out to us and um, please call and visit help for TN. Thank you, Anne Louise. Thank you so much, Jennifer and Anne. It was great to hear about those resources and an overview, Jennifer. Um, just as a reminder, both of those slides, uh, slide decks will be available in the, um, in the Dropbox. Um, we're going to actually go right now to um, another presenter who was going to give us a very brief overview about um, uh, introductions to alternatives to court. Um, he is Mr. Stephen L. Shields. He's an attorney in Memphis and a Rule 31 mediator. Um, his firm is Jackson Shields, Yeiser, Holt, Owen, and Bryant. Um, but he's also a member of the Tennessee Supreme Court Alternative Disp Dispute Resolution Commission. So I am going to uh, put a slide up. He is going to, again, just give us a brief 10 minute over overview, but there's going to be a breakout session later, um, later in the program for the those who are interested in learning more about um, mediation and alternatives to, to court as it relates to eviction. So um, without further ado, Mr. Steve Shields. Thank you, Anne Louise. I appreciate it. I will make it very brief. And so uh, in addition, I am on the commission, but I don't speak for the commission today. I speak as a Rule 31 mediator. You can see from my slide, I'm talking about alternatives to going to court and getting landlord and tenants to talk. I found it interesting. I like Director Tate's word, connect, and that is how do we connect landlord and tenants? And then I link that to what the Commissioner Clark had to say. At what point, obviously prevention, and that is, is that before there becomes a delinquency, what resources are available? The second point is, as uh, 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 Professor Prusak pointed out, was that once notice is given of a breach, then now we're pre-suit and then where I typically come in is after suit has been filed. And so the question is, how do we in fact then create a, a, a ADR program that actually addresses this even before suit is filed? I know that there's going to be a lot of discussion this afternoon about that. I know in Memphis, for example, there's facilitated negotiations in which once a suit is filed, then the person is referred, the tenant is typically referred to a MALS attorney, for example, and those attorneys then can help facilitate a conversation. Typically where I come into play is when uh, the suit has been filed and the judge then decides, as the judges here have on a number of occasions, simply referred the matter between the space between the filing and then the date of the hearing to mediation. And so what are those tools? The tools are very simple, rule 31, gives the judge the right to order parties to mediation. The Tennessee has a Supreme Court plan that emphasizes and urges the court to just do that and not only do it in person, but also to do it online. And it is very effective. 
I've had, for example, landlords say, I've been ordered here, and I guess I have to sit here and to listen to this. I go, the order's over. The moment you showed up, it's now voluntary. And of the 10 cases we've recently had here in Memphis, six out of the 10 resulted in a legal settlement agreement that can be enforced. And so as a result, then, I'm looking forward to very innovative programs. This afternoon, I know that I'm looking forward to uh, Judge Bell and um, uh, Dr. Court, uh, Dr. Kroom, I'm sorry, and of course, uh, Professor Shafson and uh, uh, Professor Mason talking and later on. And so well, there was one thing in the chat to sort of get us caught up. I found in the chat, it said, um, how do you lead a horse to water? My comment to everybody is that the horse has to know the, where the water is located. Let me get the one or two pages as a mediator that I can share with the landlord and the tenant to say, here are available resources in summary form. So in any event, I encourage and look forward to discussing innovative programs and even requiring then those that actually get to a lawsuit then being required with certain exceptions, of course, being required to get in the hands of a mediator to help facilitate talk between the landlord and the tenant. And it's amazing when that talk occurs, how many times resolution can come about. Uh, thank you, Anne Louise. I appreciate it very much. I hope that that very brief introduction has also got us right on time. Thank you very much. You did great, Steve. I appreciate you um, being mindful of time. And, and then again, I encourage everyone to please uh, check out the breakout session um, if you want to learn more about uh, court processes and, um, and mediation and alternatives to court. Um, but uh, we are back on track. So we are going to take a 10 minute break and I encourage you um, to go and grab your lunch or a snack and bring it back with you. Um, and we will get going again at uh, 11 50 central and uh, as a reminder please be sure to turn off your mic and camera because we will continue to be streaming through um, through the break so I look forward to seeing everyone in 10 minutes thank you so much
This will be a one minute warning. All right, welcome back everybody. Um, I hope you had a, a good break and were able to bring back um, a little snack for the next session. Um, now we are gonna hear about some innovative programs that are happening in two locations, both in Davidson County and in Shelby County. Um, we have um, four wonderful presenters. They're gonna talk about their programs. And then if time allows, we're going to go through um, some discussion questions. Um, feel free to put some questions up in the chat. I can guarantee we, we won't be able to get through all of them. But as I said before, we will um, be going through the chat following the event and making sure that we've addressed those and, and we'll set up a type of Q&A based on that. Um, <clears throat> so our presenters are from the Davidson County area. We have Judge Rachel L. Bell. She's the presiding judge of the Legacy Housing Resource Diversionary Court in the General Sessions Court of Davidson County, Division 8. And we also have Dr. Cynthia Kroom. She's the executive director of the Metro Action Commission in the HOPE program. Um, from our Shelby County area, we have um, Danny Shafson. He's the director of the Neighborhood Preser excuse me, Preservation Clinic and an associate professor of law at the University of Memphis Cecil C. Humphrey School of Law. And his colleague, Katie Ramsey Mason, is also going to be joining us. She's the director of the Medical Legal Clinic Partnership um, at the University of Memphis Cecil C. Humphrey School of Law. So um, I believe that... Um, Memphis is going to go first, but again, I, my brain is a little foggy on that decision, and I know that Judge Bell has some slides that she is going to share when it gets to the Davidson County, um, but, um, and then, like I said, if time allows, we will address specific questions to the group, and I have some questions already um, created for them as well, so I'm going to turn it over to, to our esteemed panelists at this moment. Thank you. Um, we did talk yesterday and we prepped um, for this this call. So we're um, Nashville, Tennessee, Davidson County is going to go first. So I'm going to share my screen. Hope everyone can see that. Okay, so my name again is Rachel Bell. Uh, thank you, um, Ann Louise, for your introduction and good morning still to everybody. We've got a few more minutes before we get to a uh, good afternoon. Um, but I am really excited to be able to share um, Nashville's approach to the eviction um, crisis um, dealing with this pandemic. Um, our mission was to provide landlords and tenants with a streamlined way to navigate the current pandemic while seeking emergency rental assistance to avoid eviction. And I do have with me today, Dr. Cynthia Kroom, who is the executive director for Metro Action Commission. We first started developing the Legacy Housing Resource Diversionary Court actually September, 2019. We um, were working with uh, United Way, Legal Aid Society, MDHA, and the Magruder Center um, that is their lead agency is Catholic Charities. We realized that we wanted to get started with a housing court um, is what we were calling it at first before we changed the name to the Legacy Housing Resource Diversionary Court. And there's a partnership with MDHA to have MDHA stop um, filing evictions for non-payment of rent matters. Um, we were gonna start a pilot project with Cumberland View, Cheatham Place, and Andrew Jackson. But then a year later, um, the pilot project was marked to handle all the properties with MDHA. But in between that time, in March, 2020, you know, we had the tornado here in Nashville. Then April, 2020, uh, COVID-19 caused us to shut down the courts and to actually um, stay home because of the safer at home order. May 2020, uh, we decided to see how we could create some virtual dockets uh, to launch the court. Um, December, um, really happy that the Tennessee Supreme Court entered the ADR plan in which we were able to use when we first um, implemented 
the Legacy Housing Resource Diversionary Court for our first docket. In January, we started talking with Metro Action Commission and the Vanderbilt Housing Law Clinic um, and seeing how we could partner with NCRC for our Rule 31 um, mediator um, entity that was going to assist us in working through receiving the CARES grant funds where there are 40 nonprofits that were working with financial assistance network they had created. February 2021, excuse me, 2021, I asked my colleagues that they would transfer all the pending cases that were in eviction court to the Housing Resource Diversionary Court so that we could court order them to mediation. Our first docket was February 23rd. Richard Rooker and his staff have come on board uh, to help us pull those dockets and create new um, dockets uh, throughout the week. March 15th, our course opened back up. And so then we had to pivot and see how we were going to handle courtrooms 1A and 1B, which um, have all the other judges um, that I are my colleagues. There are 11 of us. I'm one of 11. And we rotate on those dockets every week, Monday through Friday, from a 9 o'clock docket, 10 o'clock dockets that we have. So we staged the Metro Action Commission team called Housing Court Navigators and the Metro, um, excuse me, the Music Community Court legacy court team, the program manager, and our resource services officer outside courtroom 1A and 1B. And you'll see a picture of them there. Um, now they're court liaisons, um, court navigators that are working with individuals to see if they want to have their case transferred from courtroom 1A to 1B. So we started out with phase one. And phase one was when we opened up our portal, pushed out the press release, um, pushed out letters to go out to those landlords and tenants to let them know that they were being court ordered to mediation. Again, like I said, our first docket was Tuesday, February 23rd. On that day, it was a really exciting day because every case was settled. Um, NCRC um, had control of controlling the dockets at that time. And in any case that they had worked to uh, settle by mediation was able to be put on the three o'clock docket at that time. That was in phase two. Then phase three, we um, started working with 1A and 1B, having cases transferred to the Housing Resource Diversionary Court. And then in phase four, we opened up our two o'clock docket working with the Metro Action Commission, um, MDHA properties where Vanderbilt Housing Law Clinic um, and their law school students under um, Professor Jennifer Pusat were able to help them have legal representation. Um, this is also the partnership with Legal Aid Society has never stopped. They've been with us since phase one. But then phase five, where we work to have an aftercare program with individuals that are going through the Legacy Housing Resource Diversionary Court. So I want to kind of just show um, a, a bit of how we got started. As I stated earlier, landlord had filed the detainer. General Session court date was set. Um, we sent out letters to 1,800 cases to have them seek mediation and have the cases transferred to the Housing Resource Diversionary Court. Shortly after that, when the courts opened back up, we would allow or ask the judges to allow um, the individuals that were working in our court, the program manager or our resource services officer to make an announcement in courtroom 1A and 1B to let them know about the Housing Resource Diversionary Court and the partnership that we had entered into with Metro Action Commission, as well as with United Way and the nonprofits that are working with the Financial Assistance Network. We have um, a court docket that's set at one o'clock from those cases that are um, transferred from 1A and 1B that happens seven days, seven to 14 days after, depending on uh, the request of the lawyer, the landlord lawyer um, and the tenant of what, how soon they want to come to court. Usually it's within two weeks because we need time for them to fill out their legacy application as well as they're making sure that they are completing and doing what they need with their MAC application. We started out with three uh, continuance dates. We had stage one, stage two, and stage three. Um, however, we're navigating and moving uh, some of those opportunities to have cases settled a bit uh, quicker without multiple court dockets. So we're working through that process right now. As soon as an individual transfer their case to the Housing Resource Diversionary Court, they get a court slip. After they get their court slip, and then they come to our court, and then we work to make sure that they have a MAC application and that they have their legacy application. Um, here you'll see uh, there's a QR code that we give them with a court slip for them to uh, go on and get to our website. When they go to the website, they'll click um, Housing Resource Diversionary Court, click the button here, they'll take them the registration. They'll fill out their registration. That gives them a proper transfer to the Housing Resource Diversionary Court. So I want to show you again, a case is transferred from eviction court to the Legacy Housing Resource Diversionary Court, and then there's an initial appearance scheduled. The Metro Housing Court navigators are assigned to that case. 
if we need to get a pro bono attorney assigned or um, legal aid society attorney assigned, they're assigned to the tenant. The initial court appearance, I ask, again, is there a leg legacy application filled out? What stage are we in with the HOPE application? And what's the status of the landlord and tenant filling out their documents? Then we have another docket that'll be the second appearance docket. Um, hopefully at the second appearance docket, it's always been our goal to have the case already dismissed and ready to go. However, we have seen, you know, sometimes there's, maybe we're still waiting on uh, the landlord to sign the DocuSign agreement, or we're waiting on the landlord to submit the ledger so that it can go to payment. We sometimes do have a third appearance. I have seen some uh, in the last few weeks where we've just had two appearances, which has been great. Third appearance is usually because there's something that's not happening. The landlord's not cooperating properly or the tenant is not cooperating properly. And there are times where a landlord or tenant don't show up to court for whatever reason why. And I make sure that our circuit court clerk sends out a letter to that landlord and to that tenant letting them know about court. And I've seen a lot of um, success in that because they actually will show up. Uh, once the case is resolved, um, the good thing about having the Housing Resource Diversionary Court in partnership with Metro Action Commission is to make sure that it gets dismissed properly. I've seen some comments uh, today while I've been watching the summit where some landlords are taking the money but still kicking tenants out. We have heard that. We have seen that. And so we started uh, just a couple of weeks ago entering a order of dismissal by saying that an HRDC order will follow. In that HRDC order, it's an order that I've created to allow the tenant to use this in the future. As you know, even though the case is dismissed, it can't be expunged off their record. And because it can't be expunged off their record, we're giving them this order so they can take it to another landlord if needed when they're trying to proceed and find new places to live or housing options. Also in that order is letting them know what the agreement is with Metro Action Commission and the United States Treasury. It's ensuring that with the United States Treasury, that those funds that paid the rent good through, let's say, October, then in my order it says the tenant is obligated to start paying their rent in November. And if there's a holdover or there's a month-to-month -month lease or if there's a new lease, I'm putting that information in my order as well. All of those documents are then attached as an Exhibit A to my order. This ensures that there'll be no hiccups and no issues with the landlord taking the money, then kicking an individual out or a tenant being a bit confused on their, um, their agreement. And it also puts in the 90 day protection requirements that we have here in Nashville, Tennessee because of our affordable housing crisis. If there's an issue where a landlord and tenant don't agree, we work to then transfer them to our program where we can help the tenant find housing. Also make sure that their rearage is being paid if the landlord will take it, if the landlord won't take it, then uh, Metro Action Commission can give the money to the tenant. But we work together to make sure that I'm still able to dismiss the case because there's a vacation agreement that is entered with the landlord and the tenant so that the tenant still has a roof over their head. We also have an aftercare program um, that works, again, like I said, with disagreement or um, we ask the tenant if they want to go into our financial literacy program or a first time home buyer program. One of the challenges that we've been seeing is some lawyers want to do it their way. They have their own process that they believe works staying in our eviction courts. That's been a problem because the landlord nor the tenant get the HRDC order and the protections from the United States Treasury funds because I don't have the power to write an order from another judge who's already dismissed the case or defaulted the case. So any cases that are receiving MAC United States um, Treasury ERAP funds, we're, we're highly suggesting that the lawyer sends it to our court so it can work the process, so we can make sure there's no issues and that the tenant ends up receiving the order that they need for the protections that they need for the rest of their life and for their family. The home barrier program that we're really excited about, um, it starts out with individuals um, entering the program with Catholic charities if they have a family with individuals under the age of 18 with United Way. And if any in, any family that has individuals and they're not over under the age of 18, our partnership is with, with the Urban League and with Metro Action Commission, no matter what age they are. And then we have a mark, we're trying to get them to first place market rent. And then we're also trying to get them to create a legacy by being a first time home buyer. I failed to mention that when we have the disagreement that I showed you here, um, in the aftercare program, our partner there is Salvation Army because we're trying to find them emergency assistance um, to find housing immediately uh, so that we don't have a situation where somebody's going to end up being homeless. 
Metro Action Commission and the partnership that we have with MDHA has been going well. We're growing and making adjustments as we need on the week week to you know day day by day and week to week basis. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kroon here in a minute. But this was a meeting that we had with the Affordable Housing Task Force. We're updating them weekly and monthly, ensuring that the city of Nashville has the protections and guards in place to work towards um, our, our efforts. I also want Dr. Kroon, if you'll talk about the partnership with MDHA and what you're doing to outfit them and have them prepared, um, I would gladly appreciate that. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, and then I'm going to pull up Dr. Kroon's presentation for her um, to go in and get started with her um, presentation at this time. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Judge Bell. I'll just go ahead and, and jump in in the interest of time uh, and just say that with MDHA uh, in particular, um, we have as a part of our uh, HOPE application process uh, where MDHA, um, all of their applications are uh, set aside um, so that they are not uh, going into eviction court. We've had some that have that we've been able to get processed uh, we work with the MDHA team in particular uh, so that they have the ability to uh, move their own applications through the system. And then those applications are uh, reviewed and paid by our organization. Um, so every time an MDHA application comes into the system, we now shift that uh, to their team to make sure that all of the information is there uh, so that that application can be processed for, for payment. If you'll go to the next slide, uh, Judge Bell, I think you're still controlling that. Uh, that'll be helpful. Just as a reminder, uh, we will pay rental arrears up to 12 months. Um, and then we can pay, uh, uh, right now we automatically pay three months forward uh, because there is an affordable housing concern in Davidson County and that we, we talked a little bit about the difference between what's happening in Memphis and Nashville on our call yesterday. In Davidson County, if somebody loses housing, there's almost literally nowhere for them to go. And so when it talks about the 90 days, it's, as, uh, it's to give the tenant the additional time uh, that they would need, whether it's to get employment, but also to try and find uh, the housing that they need if they're not going to stay with the current landlord. Our payments uh, do cover legal fees. Late fees um, are also covered as a part of um, the fees that we will pay uh, to a, uh, a landlord um, so that individuals can be made whole. We will not, however, pay excessive fees. I want to just state that for the record. Uh, for example, uh, we had a situation where a landlord was charging 150 plus per day uh, for late fees. Um, that is uh, considered excessive. We will not uh, pay a late fee that's $150 per day. Um, the back rent uh, that we will pay again can go through March of 2020. Uh, we automatically, as I stated, pay three uh, months forward as well. Uh, there has been quite a bit of changes with the Treasury guidance, and we have adopted those changes. Uh, we, well, from the onset, we've always taken a written attestation uh, from our tenant uh, or from the tenant uh, if they can't produce certain types of documents. And then our um, agreement with the landlord does have a 90-day uh, eviction uh, stipulation. Uh, that's a part of it uh, that you heard Judge Bell allude to earlier. If you'll go to the next slide. Our partnership with the courts, you heard Judge Bell already talk about the court navigators. We actually have a court team uh, that is responsible for processing uh, the applications that are in the courts in addition to the court navigators that are there. Um, we receive the docket ahead of time so that we have the ability to, to see who's on the docket see if that individual has an application in the HOPE system and make sure that that individual's application is ready uh, for court. Uh, we also do on-site engagement uh, with new and existing HOPE um, customers, again, both in the courts, but also in our buildings as well. And I know it was alluded to earlier, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about it, but we do situa see situations where tenants call us and say that the landlord is attempting to evict them even though they've accepted our money. We then do place a call to the landlord, uh, making them aware of or reminding them of the agreement that they have signed 
Uh, in a number of cases, we have seen both um, the letters to the tenant withdrawn. Uh, we've also had situations where judgments were uh, against the tenant, uh, but we were able to work with either the attorney in some cases or the landlord um, and get uh, the, the situation paid and able to stabilize the housing for that uh, particular individual. If you'll go on to the next slide. This is really my final set of comments. We have expended or obligated the entire um, first um, pot of funding for our ERA1. Sorry, I'm not moving. So the lights have gone out in my, uh, in my office. Um, so those funds were expended or obligated as of yesterday. So those of you who are accustomed to seeing our, thank you, uh, our dashboard. We did not put our dashboard up yesterday because we knew that it would reflect that those dollars are uh, completely expended or uh, obligated. Uh, we do have two more pots of money that we will start to uh, show uh, a dashboard on those as well. We have $9 million uh, that uh, we have already been, uh, that's already been provided to us. That's ERA2 funding. Uh, for Davidson County, uh, that is will be distributed in part with uh, partners uh, who applied for a recent RFP that we just uh, gave out. And then effective on September 1st, uh, we will have uh, an additional $22 million from Tennessee Housing Development Agency uh, for Davidson County. So we have not uh, expended all of the dollars that are available to us, but the first pot uh, is uh, completely expended. We are now starting into part pots two and pots three of funding for Davidson County. So I want to make sure that I mention that uh, as a part of the call. Uh, that's uh, my remarks. And so uh, I'll turn it over to whoever's next. And in closing, um, I just want to be able to share that here in the city of Nashville, I would give kudos to um, our collaboration. I believe that it's gone pretty well. I mean, we are, you know, you have hiccups here and there, but I will say that the attorneys, um, the teams that we're working with, the nonprofits are all stepping up to help this situation. And um, I know Dr. Kroon would uh, join me in saying that we appreciate our partnerships and collaborations with um, all of the entities that we were able to share today and the attorneys that are on right now that you've sent your cases there. We really appreciate you with that. So I would like to turn it over to Daniel. Good afternoon, everybody. Actually, I think Professor Ramsey Mason is going to start. Tell you a little bit about our Memphis and Shelby County Rental, Use, Rental and Utility Assistance Eviction Prevention Program. Great. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, tuning in. Um, and Danny, if you could go to the next slide. Um, we wanted to start off um, just by giving a little bit of an overview of kind of where we stand with regard to evictions in um, Memphis um, and Shelby County. And, you know, those of you who are familiar with Memphis are probably not surprised um, or probably already know that Memphis has um, a very high poverty rate and a very low rate of Black home ownership. Um, and the Great Recession and the foreclosure crisis that began in 2008 um, really have, um, have contributed to some of the uh, dynamics in the rental market in Shelby County that um, have uh, fueled some of this, um, of the eviction crisis that we are now facing. Um, even before the pandemic began, um, Memphis uh, was one of the cities in the country with the highest eviction rate um, overall. And so in 2019, of course, the year before uh, COVID-19 uh, hit us, our eviction rate was 4.9%, um, which was more than twice the national average. Um, and, you know, throughout the pandemic, we've also been sort of at the center of a lot of attention regarding uh, the legal fight over the CDC's eviction moratorium. And um, in the Western District of Tennessee, the CDC's eviction moratorium, which was first issued in September of 2020, has actually been unenforceable since March of this year, um, which was several months earlier than it was um, deemed unenforceable in the rest of Tennessee, and then ultimately 
the rest of the country by the Supreme Court um, last week. So, um, you know, we have been sort of a canary in the coal mine. Um, and uh, where we stand right now in terms of eviction proceedings um, is um, uh, there are currently, since August 1st, when our courts went back to um, the pre-pandemic full docket schedule, um, we're estimating that there are about 3,000 eviction cases set um, on the court's calendars um, per week. Um, this is an increase of um, almost fourfold since uh, since even the month of July when there were about 750 cases set per week. And that had been um, the situation since March of this year and also um, in the second half of 2020. Um, we know also that in eviction cases, and this is um, this holds true across the country, but these are numbers specifically for Memphis, um, landlords are represented by attorneys in about 90% of the cases that go to court, whereas tenants are represented only in about 5% of cases. And that's actually an increase from uh, what we would have seen prior to the pandemic because almost all of the tenant representation comes from the emergency rent assistance program and the attorneys that are employed um, by that program. However, um, and this is something that you know, we're gonna about to get into in more detail, um, despite this, um, there are not as many judgments um, being taken by landlords in our general sessions courts in Shelby County as there were prior to the pandemic. Um, in fact, nearly 60% of our cases um, right now are not resulting in judgments um, because cases are being dismissed or dropped from the docket, um, largely due to ERA settlements. Um, and that is something that we think is beneficial for tenants and for landlords. And um, our judges also have, um, have really gotten on board with issuing continuances um, more freely for tenants um, and landlords who are eligible for ERA funding in order to give them the opportunity to complete that application process. So to tell you a little bit about um, the collaborative program that has come in uh, since March of this year, the, uh, the way that we've gone about distributing and trying to resolve evictions uh, using federal uh, emergency rental assistance money, we want to take you back first, give you a little background to uh, last summer, really May and June of 2020, only three or four months into the pandemic, um, the city and the county, uh, even before uh, uh, the CARES Act money that first came in, a first wave of federal money uh, to assist people in need, came into the city and county, uh, city of Memphis and Shelby County. Uh, the city and the county led an effort to pull together what resulted uh, in a, a, a partnership that included um, the University of Memphis School of Law, our uh, faculty, staff attorneys, and students working with and in our clinics, uh, the, uh, a, a nonprofit uh, called Neighborhood Preservation Inc. that served as a program manager, if you will, uh, and Legal Services, Memphis Area Legal Services, with whom we, we closely work and have partnered for many, many years. Uh, and again, city and county driving this effort. The first phase um, uh, of, of assistance actually started in earnest in the July-August time period of 2020. So before ERA, we're in the throes of the pandemic. And the effort was to pull together uh, to figure out how we can involve more lawyers, really, in the process of representing tenants who needed help to ensure that the money that was going to landlords who were in need as well uh, was going to come with protections on all sides. And through this collaboration, we were able to involve uh, volunteer lawyers, uh, professors, uh, legal services lawyers. Um, and lawyers based at Neighborhood Preservation Inc., as well as law students. And through the end of uh, 2020, we did uh, just under $2 million worth of settlements using CARES Act money to assist uh, about 1,200 families who were either in active eviction cases or were facing eviction. In the active cases, um, we negotiated agreements that resulted in dismissals, and in the uh, cases where a family was facing eviction, there was an agreement, a uh, forbearance agreement on the part of, of the landlord. So that was a very successful program. It was collaborative. Of course, it involved a, a much smaller amount of money. 
And when the uh, second round of federal stimulus came through the emergency rental assistance money, um, immediately there was uh, a core group that came back together, again, led by the city and the county. The money that has come into Memphis, um, about 20 million in a first phase came to the city and uh, just under 9 million came to Shelby County. So the effort was to figure out how can we allocate in an equitable way, in an effective way, this first phase of $28 million. So taking a lot from the lessons we learned through the what we call the eviction settlement program in the fall, um, the city and county pulled us together to plan what our ERA distribution program was gonna look like. And that program was able to launch in early March pretty quickly. A lot of the frustration at the national level, many on this uh, uh, meeting know, has been in getting these dollars out to people who need them, tenants and landlords. Um, we were able to mobilize pretty quickly and um, designed a program that was not just gonna get the money out through the city and the county. We were all gonna work together to ensure that uh, the Memphis and Shelby County Emergency Rental Assistance Program had a way to um, prioritize those who needed uh, assistance most, but also distributed money equitably to ensure that it was across zip codes, for example, across Memphis and Shelby County. That again, we were going to work in what Judge Bell talked about as these necessary protections. Money can go out. Obviously, people need help. Tenants need help. Landlords need help. But we're trying to keep people in place, keep people in stable housing, protected from really poor public health conditions and facing future eviction. So having legal uh, involvement um, and working collaboratively across the spectrum of legal partners with our municipal partners, with our nonprofit partners in Memphis, we uh, began to negotiate individual and bulk agreements. I'll talk about bulk agreements in a minute, but the idea was that anybody facing eviction, anybody facing eviction would be prioritized and uh, that we would negotiate a settlement um, on their behalf that would not just pay out money to bring them current and rent and potentially pay future rent, but also incorporate really memorialize protections for the tenant and the landlord going forward. Utility assistance has also been part of this program. I'll talk about numbers in a minute, but people facing shutoff of utilities. Um, and we were able through partnerships formed in the fall to also wrap in social service assistance. We've worked closely with organizations ranging from United Way, United Housing in Memphis to provide financial counseling, housing counseling, um, also uh, working with World Relief, for example, to reach out to um, uh, immigrant, the immigrant and refugee community in Memphis who may not qualify for assistance in other areas, but does qualify for assistance uh, through the federal dollars that have come in for emergency rental assistance. And we've also, Professor Ramsey is gonna talk about some of the efforts that have been undertaken to ensure that we are in court, that we're using this as an opportunity to study our system, to measure outcomes so that we can learn from this uh, going forward. Katie, I think this is you. Yep, so um, just a, a quick overview of the legal components of our um, ERA program. Um, we have had five, um, a, you know, on staff ERA attorneys uh, since March of 2021. And those are attorneys who have been employed by both Memphis Area Legal Services and by um, NPI, um, the Neighborhood Preservation Inc., uh, the, a nonprofit partner in the program. And um, we also have had a lot of um, uh, pro bono attorney involvement dating back to uh, last year to, to summer of 2020. Um, and the one of the real advantages that we have seen through the legal involvement in this program has been the relationships that we've been able to build with the courts, um, especially in the way that judges are now routinely asking tenants um, and also landlords um, if they are aware of the ERA program, of their eligibility, uh, potential eligibility for it, if they're aware of the application process. And um, we have had law students who have been in the courthouse, um, both in the courtrooms and also um, at uh, tables uh, or a table um, to provide information uh, to help tenants and, um, and answer questions from tenants and from landlords. Um, 
one of the other really uh, great things that we've been able to do is to match up um, people who apply to the ERA program with court records. Um, so the application asks people to self-report if they have an active eviction case that has already been filed in court, but um, that's not 100% accurate because people you know, don't always understand whether or not there is a, um, an eviction case um, pending. And so um, we've been able to uh, implement data tools um, to identify, to match names of people who apply with potential um, docket numbers of cases, even if the tenant does not self-report that they have an eviction case filed against them. They may not be aware or they may not understand uh, the question. Um, and then, of course, uh, oh, and Danny, I think this is uh, your section to talk about bulk settlements. Yeah. W one innovation that has really worked for us in Memphis. Um, again, we've got uh, thousands of people who need help. We've got uh, uh, hundreds of landlords who need assistance. And the effort has been, to be clear, to help everybody involved. I think that is something you've seen consistently across our state the programs I'm aware of, and certainly in Memphis. We want tenants and landlords working together with the court wherever possible to help as many people as possible. That has been a frustration nationally. And I think one effort, one way we have tried to address that is to engage landlords at the level of, tell us all of the tenants. We have, as in many big cities, we've got some landlords who have thousands of tenants across dozens of properties. And we have been proactive in reaching out to those landlords and saying, rather than individual settlements, talk with us about your portfolio of tenants who are behind in rent, who are facing eviction simply because of a COVID-related failure or inability to pay. And we have been able, I'll give you some statistics in a little bit, but to work out agreements that have covered tens, sometimes hundreds of tenants with one payment and to allow for the same protections um, anybody is, who is involved in these uh, uh, agreements on the tenant side has applied and been deemed eligible for assistance. And on the landlord side, these are landlords who through our program, they also have applied and provided us with information. The landlord is working directly with attorneys who manage these bulk settlements, program attorneys, often volunteers, the clinic and my clinic specifically at the U of M has done a lot of these bulk settlement agreements. We work and historically have been able to talk to landlords, talk to program uh, uh, pro property managers and say, give us your ledgers, let us look them over and we will make you an offer of 100% of the back rent. Our program, unlike the Nashville program does not pay late fees or attorney fees, but we're paying 100% of back rent up to 12 months. And as of now, one month of future rent. Uh, we'll talk more about the details, but instead of doing one-off individual agreements, which we still do, for many landlords, it has worked better. We've built relationships with them, and every month they are providing us with lists of tenants who are behind. We're able to work out payments directly to those landlords, and we'll tell you about some of the terms that come with our agreements. But the bulk settlement innovation has been a game changer for us. So um, the partners um, in our program um, have, uh, we have a, a combination of um, government, uh, nonprofit, and academic partners in the Memphis and Shelby County ERA. Um, and so we've mentioned already that Neighborhood Preservation Inc. and Memphis Area Legal Services are um, our nonprofit partners. Um, they have the attorneys, the full-time attorneys who are based um, at both of those organizations. Um, we also have the law school, which uh, both Professor Shapson and I represent, um, and the um, both our faculty, students, and our staff attorneys um, have been involved in, uh, as, as Professor Shapson just, Shapson just mentioned, um, bulk settlements, um, individual settlements. Um, reaching out to uh, to uh, assist tenants and then also um, evaluating the impact and the eviction court process in Shelby County. 
Um, we had a number of pro bono attorneys um, from across Memphis and actually even beyond um, who have assisted individual clients and also with bulk settlements um, over the course of the last um, year plus since uh, uh, the versions of this program have been running and that has been a real asset. Uh, MALS has coordinated most of those pro bono um, attorneys. And um, then uh, an organization called the State Justice Initiative um, has also supported NPI with some of the data um, uh, tools and data collection um, in partnership with uh, the U of M Law School and a local nonprofit called Innovate Memphis. So bottom lines for us is that since March of 2021, and for, for many of us, understandably, that seems like a real long time ago, but we're talking about six months. Um, here are some of our numbers uh, through, um, really, this is from earlier this month. Um, we've been able so far, just in this second wave since March of um, emergency rental assistance, been able to provide assistance to about 5,500 households. Um, lawyers have been involved in more than half of the agreements resulting in that help. Um, we've been able to distribute program-wide. Now, I think it's approaching 17 million. It may be a little bit more now. Um, this represents both rental assistance, which has been just under $11 million, I believe, and then the remaining has been utility assistance so that we can get people working directly through payments to our local utility company, Memphis Light, Gas, and Water. Um, and the bulk settlement amount, we think in terms of the $11 million or so in emergency rental assistance payouts just on the rent side, um, the bulk settlements represent more than half of that. So our clinic, for example, has done almost $800,000 in bulk settlement agreements. Um, to give you a, a recent example, in July, the program was able to negotiate a, a, a $1.27 million settlement with a local landlord who has many properties, and that uh, resolved the evictions active and those facing eviction for more than 600 tenants. So all in one fell swoop because of the relationship built with the landlord and the agreement with that landlord, who, as I said, it has uh, tens of properties across Memphis and uh, approaching 4,000 tenants, there is an initial agreement in place to do more than $10 million in future agreements. So trying to help as many people as possible before many of these cases ever get to court. That's our aim. Katie, is this you? Yes. Um, so um, some of the, uh, Dr. Kroom talked earlier about some of the protections um, for the Nashville and Davidson County program. And um, uh, some of them overlap certainly with, um, you know, with what we are trying to accomplish in Memphis. Um, but there are a few specifics that are different. Um, and so uh, as, as Professor Shafson mentioned a minute ago, unlike in Nashville, um, our program is not paying late and legal fees um, for tenants. We are paying 100% of the contract rent um, but the landlord, when they accept the payment, has to agree to amend the ledger to show a zero balance through the month um, of the payment uh, that was received. Um, and also to agree not to file a negative credit report based on that debt that was resolved through ERA funds. Um, our agreement requires a 45-day um, uh, stay on the landlord filing a new non-payment eviction case um, for any arrears that arise um, in the future or after the payment is received. And so the landlord um, receives one month of future rent payment under our program and then um, for 45 days from the end of that month that is covered by the payment, they are not allowed to um, uh, to uh, file another eviction case um, uh, if the tenant falls behind again. Um, landlords are also asked to self-certify that their property, the property that they own is in compliance with um, local housing codes and, um, and to cooperate with uh, code inspectors or, and other inspectors that, are, that may do random inspections, which is actually something that they already um, are required to do under um, our code enforcement provisions. Um, and then also, uh, the if the landlord agrees to accept um, the payment on behalf of uh, the tenant, they agree that they will negotiate a new lease um, at the end of the lease term, um, as long as the tenant remains current um, at the time that the lease expires. An important point here, we didn't list it, but of course, all of our agreements require any active FED case to be dismissed. 
It's often the case that judgment has already been taken in the case. We attach orders to our agreements, orders, captioned orders that have to be uh, uh, put on file um, and uh, secured by the landlord's attorney where, where appropriate or the landlord, um, but also to uh, order setting aside previously entered judgments so that we can try to bring the tenant back from that place of an active case or a judgment having already been taken. Um, and of course this code and the conditions issues, um, we really have not gotten a lot of pushback from landlords. And that's an important thing here where code enforcement resources are limited and often difficult to activate. Um, this has really helped. It's been important to all the city and county have really been at the forefront of driving this particular requirement. And quickly run through this. Um, so in terms of um, the evaluation and long-term um, uh, uh, program structure evaluation, um, the, um, the State Justice Initiative, as I mentioned a minute ago, has, um, has funded a study um, to, uh, to not only allow uh, the, the MSCRA to identify additional applicants who might be actually facing eviction if they don't self-report it, um, but to also um, uh, uh, collect data in court and to look at the court processes and the impact of the ERA assistance that um, that uh, that is that that is having on um, the court outcomes and court process itself. And so, um, through um, for the first few months that the program was going, um, the um, uh, the data tools were able to identify more than um, 2,000 applicants who uh, had not self-reported that they had an eviction and were able to help those folks access um, uh, the legal services. And um, also uh, between March and the end of July, um, University of Memphis law students were able to observe um, more than 4,400 cases um, and record a lot of the information that because General Sessions Court is is not a court of record, um, does not necessarily get recorded in um, on the uh, detainer warrant or on the information that is um, be available online. And um, only, um, as I mentioned earlier, only about 41% of cases are resulting in judgments um, for landlords. This is the last slide, just to, to know, anybody who wants more information about the Memphis and Shelby County Emergency Rental Assistance Program, please go to home901.org. We also can get information. We have uh, all these materials translated in numerous languages. Here's uh, Swahili, Arabic, and French. Um, there are dialects translated. It's, it's been incredible. Our rural relief partners are, have helped us with that. The application for assistance for both tenants and landlords is on homeowner901.org in, in addition to lots of other information about the program and how it works. So we'll make our, our information available too, and these slides we'll share, but um, please go to home901.org if you have any questions or if you need assistance. Thank you all so much um, for, for sharing what's going on in, um, in Memphis and in Davidson County. Um, we have just about Mm, nine minutes or so, 10 minutes or so left in this session. I was looking at the chat and there weren't a ton of questions coming up, but I do um, have some that I'd like to ask just to try to pull out some um, nuggets of wisdom that we might be able to share with other locations. Um, and um, I'm just going to ask it and then whatever panelist wants to to take that question, please, uh, please be able to do so. So one thing, and this is um, sort of for the uh, selfish reasons, but um, one, I'm interested to learn um, how you are, uh, what methods you've used to communicate about your programs with landlords and how you've been able to pull them into the process. I think that is something, that's a question that we've gotten a lot at our office and I'm interested to hear your work in that area. Um, we started our program with uh, landlord liaisons. We had uh, a landlord liaison and we had landlord meetings. Um, those initial meetings was really just trying to make sure that they were aware of the process. Um, and then after that, uh, uh, some of what I heard today um, or from Memphis was similar in that we would look into the system and then we would group um, the applications by landlord. So if you were a particular landlord with a certain number of applications or a larger number of applications, we would uh, schedule meetings with you, talk to you about the status of your tenants' applications, 
and then work with you to try and get your tenants applications to completion so that we could uh, take care of uh, larger housing units together. That was one of the ways that we, sorry, not moving enough. Uh, that was one of the ways that we were able to um, make sure that we communicated with landlords. The other uh, thing was the smaller landlords who we saw uh, being impacted while we were really focusing a lot on the larger landlords, uh, then um, started to reach out to more of them because actually more of them started to come in our doors or call and say, look, what's going on? There are applications in the system, but they weren't large landlords. So that group initially, um, I think, was neglected more because there was such a, a huge focus on these, these large sets of, uh, of applicants that were there, but that's uh, some of the ways that we uh, reached out to landlords. And I'd like to um, say, before we started that process, we sent letters, uh, Richard Ricker's office um, got in touch with every pending case that was pending in Nashville, Tennessee, that was um, hadn't been heard yet. There was 1800 cases. So we sent out letters and emails to the landlords and to the landlord attorneys to let them know about the um, program that we were establishing here in Nashville. And then also meeting them at the courthouse, right on the spot, um, trying to make sure that we were able to push them away from eviction court into the housing resource diversionary court. Can I just add in Memphis, um, we've had forums like this one for landlords where we've invited through our context, trying to get as many landlords and their representatives to come. That, that We did that early on and we did it frequently. Um, we also have really utilized um, our relationships with landlords' attorneys. It, it is the case in many big cities that it's a smaller grouping of landlords that handle representation uh, of landlords' attorneys who represent most of the landlords. And that's big and small in a lot of cases. Um, and they have been wonderful advocates for our program, um, some more than others, but it is uh, most of the bulk settlements I have worked on started out with the client of one of uh, our, our sort of usual landlord's attorneys, he, he essentially referred our program and put his clients in touch with me, which is a significant thing given what we've told you about attorney's fees not being paid, but it's been an all hands on deck effort. And um, uh, that has been a wonderful outgrowth of this, one we hope is gonna continue should we get to the other side of this pandemic, but the landlord's attorneys in many instances have been strong advocates for our program and getting the word out to their clients. And on the point about mom and pop landlords, that's such an important point, Dr. Kroom. Um, we talk about that a lot. I know the city and county in Memphis, they really want to make sure that there's not um, an equity issue in terms of how we're reaching out to big landlords versus small because that can happen, not intentionally, but that is a really important point. So um, if you are a mom and pop landlord, you don't have many properties, you are not in any way foreclosed from this program and we want to help you too. So um, home901.org on the Memphis side. Okay, thank you. I think we've got time for maybe one more question. Um, and um, I'm also interested in hearing um, what was uh, perhaps a surprising obstacle that you encountered and, and how were you able to overcome that? Well, I can just say from our side uh, in, in Nashville, um, the treasury, initial treasury guidance was a bigger obstacle than I think initially we thought it was going to be. And what that ended up with is a lot of applications that were by treasury standards incomplete. Uh, we still have a number that are, uh, but when they, as they started to really relax guidance, and most, I think many people don't know how in actively engaged many of us were with the treasury department saying, hey, you all have got to do something because this is making it very, very hard. And so I think that uh, getting them to relax the guidance was probably one of the, the big ones um, and they did respond. It's just that they responded in multiple phases. We couldn't get as much uh, changed as quickly as we had hoped. I think that would be one. And then I think the other one was uh, getting a system um, set up that would allow you to be able to do what they were asking you to do in the beginning and still meet all of these requirements that they were telling you that they were going to come in and, and then, you know, look at whether or not you had met them. So 
I think for us in the very beginning, that was a big factor. And I, I mentioned earlier that effective yesterday, we had either, uh, we've either paid out or obligated the entire first uh, part of about 20 million. Um, but we were able to speed things up through some uh, really making some quick changes, uh, bringing on some more people again, uh, uh, working through some of the uh, initial sort of issues. Um, but the, the relaxing of the treasury guidance was huge. And I think you're, you're seeing that across the country that that really has been a difference maker. And I'll say um, we've had some large dockets. I don't think we realized one particular day, um, we started out just having it once a week. Now we're having dockets three to four times a week and we're sparsing them out. So there are not so many um, people coming on one particular docket, one particular day. And I had no idea. We started court at 1.30. We have another docket at 2.30. We had another docket at 3.30. Because there were so many people on each one of those dockets and on this particular day, each landlord attorney and the tenant wanted to have a two or three minute discussion about their particular case. This is the first time we did this because we wanted to kind of answer some questions because the guidance had loosened up. We came up with a new process to say what stage they were in with the MAC application. On that day, we realized we can't do that. They need to go in the hallway and ask MAC. And then we hired the housing court navigator so they could let them know what stage they're in. When we literally started court at 1.30 and we didn't finish court until nine o'clock at night because each person wanted to hear from me, the judge, what stage they're in. And I said, look, all I want to do is make sure that we have a MAC application, we have a legacy court application here in place so we can safeguard the process. And if you'll go out in the hallway with the MAC team and the legacy housing resource diversion team, they'll give you that information. So now um, those dockets are back uh, the way we need them to be. But that was a challenge because we didn't want to turn people away because our dockets were full. So we were just accepting everybody. Now we've opened up four other dockets throughout the week, Monday through Thursday in the morning where we have dockets at 1130 now. And we also still have the Tuesday docket for the cases that are initially being transferred. So come October, um, we're going to actually have dockets probably every day but Friday, which is going to be good. Um, so that was something that we had to handle and try to get that uh, taken care of. So that was a challenge. But um, I think we're, we're, we're moving forward in a, in a, a, a swifter way if we can. Well, um, I want to thank you all for your time. I know that you um, spent a lot of time, again, helping us uh, prepare for this event today and for um, your presentations. And um, I um, encourage everybody to, uh, to stick around. We're going to take a very short break, a five-minute break, and then we're going to um, close out the plenary portion and go into our breakout sessions. So um, let's report back. I've got to get my watch to turn on um, at one o to Central Time, um, and I'll see everybody in just a few, few minutes. Thank you all. Great panel. Thanks, everybody.
everybody. I just realized I misspoke about the return time. So um, if um, everybody could just come back on at 12.55, so just five more minutes, please. Just come back on at 12.55 Central. Thanks, and I apologize for that. One minute warning. Okay, everybody, if um, you can hop back on, we're going to close out the plenary session and then 
go into our breakouts. So um, I just want to thank everybody for joining us here today. I know you've heard a lot of information. It's all been um, overwhelming for some, I assume. Um, please, please refer to the Dropbox, um, and we are going to be continuing to add resources to that. Um, we'll have recordings of today's session. Um, we also will have um, other recordings of some topics that are related to this um, that we are uh, going to be producing throughout September. So please keep that link handy. Uh, we will send it out to you along with um, other links and information following the summit. Um, so I want to take us back to our opening uh, remarks um, in talking about that, the, you know, evictions is historically an, an adversarial process, but there, there are no villains here. And we need to convene and work together to, to make landlords whole and also stabilize, stabilize the housing situation. Um, there is in your Dropbox link a video that the U.S. Attorney General released yesterday of a call to action to how the legal community can help in the crisis. But it's not just the court and judges in the legal community that needs to be at the table. It's all of our nonprofits, all of our social service providers, landlords, tenants, and the advocates that represent them. So we have created seven breakout sessions um, for, for you all to pick to choose from. We did that with um, the questions that you answered when you registered as to what um, an opportunity that you uh, see in your area um, for improvement. So um, the set, they're on your agenda. In just a moment, I'm going to open them up and you'll be able to select where you wanna go. We have um, one or two folks in each one facilitating them. Um, and then there also will be um, someone from my office, the administrative office of the courts in there so we can uh, record them and be able to, to have that as well um, as we build up our FAQs and resources links following the event. So real quickly, I'm gonna read them out. We have a rental assistance and resources breakout for Davidson County, one for Shelby County and one for Knox County. That was based on um, the locations where people um, reside or, or where, they, where they work when you registered what, what city you listed. We have one that will encompass our other counties for rural and suburban rental assistance and resources. We, our fifth one is communication, outreach, and education. We have court process and alternatives to court and legal help. And they are named those, so you don't have to remember numbers or anything like that. Um, when we do go to breakouts, though, we will, I believe, lose the closed captioning option. Um, and we will be cutting the, the live stream feed because there will not be a, a meeting going on in this main Zoom room. Um, the official breakouts end at 1.30 as the, the time uh, our event ends, but um, we are gonna keep them open and this main room open till two. And so if there are those in there that you want to connect with more, if you wanna come back in here and debrief and, and talk some more, um, we wanted to provide that opportunity to everyone. Um, as we know, this is a statewide event when we know that there's um, some folks here who may just not actually um, be able to, to have that opportunity to converse with each other sometimes. So um, in just a second, I'm gonna go ahead and open those rooms. And like I said, you'll be able to pick where you want to go. Give me a minute for that. Okay. You'll be able to come back to this room at any time if you have questions. And then you'll also be able to, to chat to ask help um, for, for me. Um, that'll alert me. So if you get stuck somewhere and there's no one else in that room, which shouldn't be the case, but um, something like that, you should be able to to chat with me as well, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and open those rooms. And you will should see them now. You'll be able to click on one. If you have some issues clicking, just um, again, let, you'll, you stay in here and you can unmute yourself and, um, and let me know and I'll be happy to help. <laughs> 